everyone. I'd like to call to order the audiology practice committee. Um, today is February 24th. It is uh, nine o'clock. Uh, I'd like to call the roll first to make sure we have a quorum. Um, if you could just say aye if you're here. Um, Karen Chang. Or aye. Here. Tulio Valdez. Aye. Amy White. Aye. And of course I'm here. So we have established a quorum. I'd like to ask now for public comment for items not on the agenda. You can ask the um, um, the moderator if you would open the for public comment. This is the moderator and at the direction of the committee, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment for items not on the agenda, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function and audio only participants can raise their hand by pressing star three on their device. I'll go ahead and pause a moment to allow the public time to access these features and submit their requests. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, thank you. I'd like to move on to agenda item three, uh, discussion and possible action regarding statutory and or regulatory requirements related to audiology aid, scope of practice, and supervision requirements as stated in business and professions codes, a code section 2530.2 and title 16. California Code of Regulations, sections 1399.154 through 1399.154.7. Um, you have the memo in front of you, and while it may be a little tedious to listen to somebody read, I think the complexity of this issue uh, would be um, uh, helped if I were to read uh, what the issues are. So starting with uh, page 104, background, um, the board received reports that there was a lack of clarity regarding appropriate clinical tasks and supervision requirements for audiology aides. Supervisors have expressed concern that either audiology aides were being allowed to perform any and all clinical services normally provided by an audiologist without the training or education of an audiologist, or supervision requirements were so strict that there was little point in utilizing an aid. In some cases, audiology aides have been reportedly trained to a level that a supervisor is considered to be competent for a particular clinical task and then left to perform that task independently without supervision from a super supervisor who is physically present. Reports of these types of misapplication of the regulations of audiology aides led the board to discussing this issue at the October uh, 10th, 11th, 2019 meeting. Uh, at that board meeting, the board discussed feedback received from audiology licensees who utilize audiology aids, including complaints of ambiguity regarding the regulatory requirements for the clinical tasks allowed to be performed by an audiology aid and the type of supervision required for them. The board then directed the audiology practice committee to define the tasks of an audiology aid can perform and the supervision necessary. And in addition, consider any legislative or regulatory changes needed toward implementation. At the uh, February 20th, 2020 um, audiology practice committee meeting, the committee discussed language from um, the American Academy of Audiology and the American Speech Line Hearing Association regarding the role of an audiology assistant. The audiology assistant language is more closely aligned with audiology aids uh, in California. The language stated that audiology assistants should be trained to do specific tasks that support the audiologist without being allowed to make diagnostic decisions. The committee discussed concerns regarding whether and when the supervising audiologist might be physically present because the regulations are unclear. The committee decided that reviewing the AAA and ASHA lists of tasks recommended or not recommended for audiology assistance would be a good starting point to engage associated materials, oh, um, point to engage stakeholders in the development of a regulatory package. Board staff brought to the committee's attention that any regulatory package needed to explain why a particular task would be outside the scope of responsibilities of an audiology aid and that it be might but might be more effective to develop different levels of supervision requirement for audiology aids, similar to those for uh, speech language pathology assistance. The committee also discussed its concern that both um, 
the AAA and ASHA recommend these individuals complete continuing education requirements, but understood that under current statute that the audiology in California is a one-time registration with no renewal requirement or continuing education requirement, and that this issue would have to be addressed as part of the sunset review. At the February 2020 meeting, the committee decided to work with staff to use the AAA and ASHA recommendations to help develop a list of tasks and supervision requirements for audiology aids for stakeholder consideration at a future meeting. In the May 2022 meeting, the committee delegated review of this topic to, to Dr. Raggio and Dr. White to continue discussions regarding lists of tasks and supervision requirements. Since that meeting, um, Drs. Raggio and White reviewed the materials um, on aid duties and various position papers on the issue, along with reviewing the way that board staff review the current audiology aid application duties specified by the supervisor. During these discussions, um, Drs. Raggio and White came to the conclusion that a list of allowable tasks would never be exhaustive enough, nor be able uh, to keep pace with innovations in the field of audiology to be truly useful. They determined that it would be more helpful uh, to both the licensed public applicants and board staff to concentrate on duties that were absolutely outside the scope of audiology aid. In addition, they would provide additional clarity in the regulations of the role of the audiology aid within the audiology practice and criteria that would clearly delineate what tasks were outside the scope of practice of an audiology aid. At the last meeting, October 27-28, um, the Audiology Practice Committee reviewed the current statutory and regulatory requirements related to audiology scope of practice and supervision, which you will find in Attachment A, and discussed the evolution of the aid designation, the practicalities of aid designation, given the scope uh, limitations and the potential for using slip of supervision as a model for audiology aid supervision. So, Page three of four talks about the issues that are under consideration today. Um, for additional clarity, the committee wanted to make stakeholders aware that this agenda item only discusses audiology aids, aid issues. Um, there was a discussion of potential future licensure category for audiology assistance. Um, but we are going to table that for now and really focus today on the audiology aid issues um, alone and not look at a new license type at this time, but we will at future meetings. To begin discussions of the audiology scope of practice and clarifying the supervision, board staff recommended reviewing the November 6, 2015 proposed regulatory changes regarding audiology aids as a starting place. In addition, the, in the Sunset Review 2022, the board recommended le legislative changes um, that would require uh, SLP and audiology aid uh, registrations to expire every two years and at the time of renewal require the supervisor or the aid to update the board on the duties the aid performs while assisting the supervis supervisor in the practice of SLP or audiology and the training program and assessment methods the supervisor is utilizing to ensure that it is continued comp competency. Uh, also to define audiology aid uh, similar to SLP aid as any person meeting the minimum requirements established by the board. So as you can see, we've been allowed by the Sunset Review to make at least those changes um, uh, that that would allow a renewal of the license or a renewal of the registration, I should say. Um, so one of our goals today is to implement, is to start discussions on implementing the stat statutory changes, creating and codifying registration renewal requirements, uh, including renewal form requirements. Um, so we, we want to accomplish that today. Um, we want to provide language to codify the initial registration form and make current registration process and the process. Language to codify notice termination form and removal of any generated terms, uh, gendered terms and correct any grammatical errors. But in addition to that, the committee may wish to consider changes that include the following. Incorporating previously discussed changes, which you will see in a, a pendant, a attachment B, um, align the requirements of a supervisor with supervision requirements for other license registration types. So um, I, I think the uh, trying to 
codified language or developed language for codification um, is fairly straightforward that the committee could work with the board to develop um, that so that we can implement the sunset review allowance of renewal every two years. Uh, we can make these other substantive changes that are required that are suggested here, termination form and removing of gendered terms and, and grammatical errors. But what we also have to talk about is the, the second part, and that is if you look at Appendix B, um, you'll see what how long we've been working on this, as you can see, at least since 2015, and probably before that, um, trying to come up with acceptable tasks, acceptable supervision, and um, always came up short thinking that we, we'll never uh, list everything that's possible. Uh, things will change all the time and we won't be able to keep up with it. And we don't want to commit something to language in a, in a statute or a regulation that we're then just going to have to change again. So I'd like to open for discussion um, these, these issues, uh, particularly in Appendix B, um, as to what kinds of, do we want to go with the idea that there are particular tasks an audiology can do and can't do and what kind of supervision we would like to implement. Dr. Rajo, this is Paul Sanchez. Can I make a comment? Of course. Yeah, I just wanted to point out one of the reasons for the delay in, in promulgating these regulations has been that we were somewhat limited by the statutory language that existed prior to our most recent sunset review. There was some confusing language on the definition of an audiology aid that was different than the definition of an SLP aid. And the language in itself um, alluded to or, or said that audiology, that an audiology aid can practice audiology. And it was a little bit confusing and, and put a little, um, put some limitations on us limiting their scope of practice. So I just wanted to give that background. We just got that cleared in our, in our November sunset. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I, um, I'd like to ask members of the Audiology Practice Committee to weigh in on um, some of the tenets of a, that you see in the regulatory language for Appendix B that only lists two kinds of supervision, for example, direct, um, which is on-site observation and guidance, and indirect. I, I don't see anything in here about immediate supervision. Um, Apologies, Dr. Raju. This is the original, this is Sharice Burns, um, and the original language from 2015 had the similar construction where the um, immediate supervision was separated out and it wasn't at the top. Um, it wasn't in, in order of immediate, direct, and indirect. Um, is so it in this document somewhere? It's, yeah, it's in, um, it's in subdivision C. So 1399.154.1.1. Uh, um, the proposed changes in subdivision C. It just, it's at the very bottom. It's just out of order. Anyway, so uh, that's under this. Um, oh, no, it isn't. It isn't. Um, so I, I would like to uh, ask any members of the Audiology Practice Committee to weigh in on um, what they think of not only the supervisory um, requirements, which are not stipulated, and they're they're noted what they and how to define them, but how they're utilized is not stipulated uh, currently in regulation. And then I'd like to draw your attention to the last page, um, 1399.154.8, activities, duties, and functions outside the scope of responsibility of an audiology aid. And um, and yeah, so that's what I'd like to discuss with the committee. Hi, this is Karen. Um, while reading this, I actually did, I wrote down the question um, because when I, I read, when I read 1399.154.1.1, um, I was actually um, wondering what would be the difference between direct supervision versus immediate supervision when I was reading the, um, the two, so A and subsection C. Um, I wasn't, because I remember we were talking about um, over the shoulder. So I wasn't sure which one, either direct supervision or immediate supervision would be over the shoulder. Um, I, I interpret immediate supervision to be over the shoulder and direct supervision to more 
um, on you're site, as it says, observation. Yeah. So you're there in the facility. It's not like you're remotely there as in indirect supervision. That's how I interpret it. Is there any uh, anybody who can lend any more information to that? I agree um, with the way you're interpreting it myself. That's how I understood it when we were discussing it with regard to the um, trainees for dispensing. Okay. Actually, you know, um, to make it, um, I guess, flow better, can we do um, direct supervision, A, and then, you know, whatever you guys write, and then B, do immediate supervision, and then C, do indirect supervision, and then you go down to one, two, three, four. Yeah, I might even have immediate supervision be the first, uh, it would be A. Yeah. Is the most stringent. Uh, oh, yeah, that's true. So A would be immediate supervision, B direct supervision, and then C indirect supervision, and then the one, two, three, four. Can I just ask for an aside here, perhaps from Sharice and Paul? And Paul. Um, we're always struggling with what's allowed for an industrial aid. I don't know who that is and why that language appears all over these regulations in one way or another. Is there is there a need to keep that language in there? I think there was a definition of industrial aid somewhere. Yeah, there, there, hi, this is Paul. There is a definition, and I think that that's probably something that we can research more. Sharice and I were actually just talking about that a couple of days ago because I think that that language was put there intentionally, but I'm not sure. My understanding was that these uh, these were aids that were working in um, with manufacturers. That, but I'd have to. We'd have to probably do some research on that. Yes. Yeah, I was just going to say I don't. I just don't know who that is or what. If there is such a person out there, perhaps Amy White knows more. Yeah. Do you have any experience with that? Yeah, I would say that's are those are ones that are involved in the OSHA hearing screenings in factories and industries which require that where an audiologist might be overseeing the program, but they usually have aides out there doing the hearing screenings um, for all the staff as needed for OSHA. I can imagine that is what it is, but I don't know if there's anyone in California who would meet that um, that who works in that situation. I don't really know. But, yeah, uh, I, I'm not sure how all that's contracted out anymore. I don't have a personal experience with it. Um, but if they're not, I mean, I wonder who is doing it. If I'm it's not an audiologist overseeing AIDS, yeah, I'm not sure. If you call um, that out, is there, are there other kind of specialized AIDS that are? It says, um, it says here in section 1399.154, the definitions on section D, Industrial audiology means an audiology aid who conducts pure tone air conduction threshold audiograms for the purpose of industrial hearing testing in addition to other acts and services as provided in these regulations. Yeah, and that's just what, what Amy described. Oh, okay. It's just that um, I, I don't believe, and I, I could certainly be wrong, but that there are any industrial um, aid uh, positions in California. And, and I, I would probably, I, don't know. I would want to add that, oh, I was just going to add that a lot of this language was developed historically from um, national organizations um, and, and different states kind of adopted that language. So this may be something that is relevant in some other part of the country and not as relevant here in California. And that's something that, as I mentioned earlier, Sharice and I were talking about we need to kind of research this and find out if this is something that is even used in California. Yeah, that would be a good idea, I think, because I I, I think you're right, Paul, that it um, was adopted from um, places where there are large manufacturing entities uh, in the Midwest and East um, where this kind of audiology aid may be used. And it's just not applicable to any reasonable extent in California to include it in this in our regulations. I mean, if we wanted to make some general statement about, uh, I don't know, industrial or any other kind of specialized aids, then I'd have to investigate that. Um, we could make a, a statement, a sentence about it. And this is Sharice, just from a, a board staff perspective, we don't have any way to 
identify an, an industrial audiology aid versus an audiology aid, um, aside from the duties um, that a supervisor might assign them. So um, even if we have some, it, we wouldn't really be able to pinpoint like how many of them tell us tell us they're in industrial audiology aids without manually literally reading through um, each folder to review um, what's in it. So, so an audio uh, an industrial aid would have to apply to be registered with the state, right? It's my understanding that that they're included as an audiology aid, so they still would be registered, but they would be allowed to do more um, more things without the supervision part, um, which yes. is in, um, so they could do more independently. And I think it's in here somewhere. Do you have records of, of uh, industrial aids in the files of uh, registers? Register people? We have all aid registration files. Sorry, I've been skipping around here. Um, so, but they're all individual. So it's by each aid. So you would have to kind of historically go through and look at all the aid folders and see um, what are the duties listed? Did they identify as an industrial audiology aid or not? And, and it could be that we have them. I, in, in my years with the board, I've never had a staff person come and ask me a question or bring to me an application from an industrial audiology aid. Mm -hmm. That doesn't not mean that they teachers. aren't there. Yeah. Right. It just means that it, with with some of our newer staff, it, you would think that that question would come up. Oh, look, what is an industrial audiology? And I have this application. Mm -hmm. So I have not had that experience. So, OK, so we'll um, leave it that y you and Sharice will uh, try to investigate that further to see how applicable it is to keep that language in there. So as I see this issue, um, in trying to assist those who, who evaluate the, um, the applications in determining what are acceptable tasks and what are not, the, um, the changes, the suggested changes from 2015 are indeed a place to start. Um, are there any audiology practice committee members who have a, a thoughts or opinions about this list? Um, so I like the list a lot. I mean, I think it's, it's pretty comprehensive in terms of delineating that, you know, we're not going to be interpreting or doing diagnostic testing procedures, um, but uh, that at other, otherwise, you know, serving as the assistant is, is what I think we're getting at. Um, to me, it, it seems pretty clear. Um, I don't know, you know, to your earlier question, it's interesting that we're defining immediate direct and um, indirect supervision, but we're not defining when that may need to be used. So it's kind of um, interesting that we have it in there without further explanation. Uh, I, other than to say, perhaps that's how when uh, the audiologist is submitting the plan for training and, and supervision and what that plan is going to look like, that they would be able to then just use those terms of immediate, direct, indirect to, to define how they were going to use their aid. Is that maybe the idea? You know, I, I, I have the same thoughts. You I don't actually know the answer to that, whether that's what we were intending. Um, but it, it should be stipulated somehow. We can't just throw that in unless we want to um, stipulate that way, that you can use those descriptors um, for describing your plan of training and supervision for your aid. That I don't know if Sharice wants to speak to that, that that's uh, the notion or do you, is that a reasonable thing to do? I, I think it's reasonable. There's also the, um, since this is older language, the option to add more in there about when immediate supervision is required um, for different tasks um, or, or for like a certain range of tasks versus direct or um, additionally have uh, similar to what we're looking at for SLIPAs is um, the first 90 days that you have an audiology aid um, does everything need to be at immediate supervision? So they're getting that training, um, that kind of a thing. Um, so there's different ways that more meat can be added to these bones of just saying what this, this 
uh, level of supervision is, just defining the level, but you can also add more in there about requirements regarding those levels. <clears throat> But I can do see I do see where back in 2015 this was starting to look like um, attempting to get more towards that um, leveled supervision that the slippers have, um, and then there can be more added in here. You know, um, you know whether or not immediate supervision is needed for the first 90 days that the audiology aid is there. You know, you need to be over the shoulder or immediately present, and then after that, does it go down to direct? Um, are there certain um, procedures that uh, they can be trained to do that always need to be immediate or um, can most of them go down direct um, because other items would be off the table or outside the scope. No, I, okay. I think okay. it makes the most sense to have the um, supervision more defined under the training, you know, section, maybe under the, the section under training of AIDS, you know, making it clear there that when they're new and they're first being trained that first 90 days, as you were mentioning, Sharice, you know, perhaps is a more of an immediate or direct supervision requirement um, and something along those lines, I think is more appropriate probably than task-based, more manageable. I think it's attractive that the 90 day immediate supervision um, for tasks that are not on this list um, because these are are forbidden. You can't do these things. And we, if we agree with this list, um, then we're saying it's for everything else, meaning uh, ear impressions. Um, I don't know if you would say conduct diagnostic evaluations. Amy would be no tympanometry because that is a diagnostic uh, evaluation. How how do you look at that? I would agree with that. I think we're, I think it gets really murky. Um, you know, you can say, well, I can run the temp and just not make the interpretation, which means is it diagnostic or non-diagnostic? Um, but the test is the test. And um, I think it gets a little murkier when you get into to performing that test. Whereas when we say, you know, like a hearing test, obviously a diagnostic hearing test would be, you know, airborne speech, all, all of the common requirements of a 95557, whereas a, a air conduction screening, you know, isn't a diagnostic test. Um, and I think those delineations are pretty clear, clearly understood. Um, I don't know about Tim's. I think, I think it is a little tougher. I I think it it does say evaluation. That, that's the language here that they say evaluation. So they're not talking about uh, diagnosis with it, um, but it, it isn't a diagnostic evaluation. Um, I would read it that way. I don't I don't see serum and management on this list, uh, but I would kind of uh, I, I my instincts are to put it on that list. Do you see it somewhere? No, it's certainly not on there. Because we, I don't think in 2015 we could do it. I don't remember when that, um, it was It was around that time, right? When that changed? Probably. Yes, by, by that time, um, audiologists were, were allowed to do it. I, I think that the board just ran into problems of, you know, this exhaustive list, and I think they just stopped there. But so it, I think it's going to be on the list. I would add that to the list. Yeah. So um, any other comments by uh, committee members? Um, this is Cherie. So I was just going to note that, you know, as we use these 2015 regs as a, a springboard or a starting point, um, I, I would mention that we can also look at doing similarly to um, the SLIPAs is you not only define the levels of supervision, but if there's um, different types of supervision required at different levels, again, the 90 days and so on, we can add more detail to these items. Um, and we can also um, be a little more clear and update language if needed. Um, the other thing I would add in there is, um, but I think maybe Karen already mentioned it, but similar to the hearing aid trainees, instead of like the slippers where more 
remote supervision might be allowed. This would be less remote supervision because um, I know these were done before we were talking about telehealth and, and remote supervision, but it sounds like maybe for the audiology aid, we really do want it to be more on site in person. I would agree with that. Yeah, me too. Okay. I also think that uh, defining performing versus interpreting is a big, big deal. Um, and should be somewhere in the wording. You said performing versus interpreting. In, yeah, for example, even if it's a, a tympanogram, because that may not be on scope of practice. With interpretation comes risks, basically. Yes. I, I don't know if we want to um, spell out a tympanometry under diagnostic evaluation, but we could so that there's no a gray area there about that. Also, I was just going to say, I think um, just just how we just had this conversation two minutes ago, is tympanometry a diagnostic evaluation? Well, what if I'm doing a temp screener and I'm just running the screening temp and not the, you know, not a full emittance battery with reflexes and, you know, now, now is it no longer diagnostic? Um, so if we, because of the murkiness of that, you know, it may be worth putting that in there. Just like um, down below we have um, diagnostic VNG, ENG, ABR, et cetera. Okay, um, so at this point, would we be comfortable with um, adding sermon management to this list, implementing the, the uh, kind of reworking of the, the language of the list as, as Sharice mentioned, uh, to update it, um, to make sure that we make clear performing versus interpreting um, language is clear, unequivocal in here and perhaps develop um, uh, supervision for things like uh, uh, taking ear impressions or any other training that they're going to do with over the shoulder for 90 days and then allowing direct supervision. Are we kind of- I, I think, yeah, I think more that, Marcia, rather than make it task specific, I think the, the 90 day, you know, hey, this is while you're training, everything's going to be immediate because how else are we going to verify? Um, and then once the training is complete, then we can start backing off on that. I think it makes it uh, more clear for anyone trying to go through the process um, and a lot less gray area. Would you say if we don't stipulate certain activities, then it's people are free to interpret that um, to be whatever task isn't listed here? Are we okay with that? I am. I mean, again, reading that list, I think is it's it's pretty inclusive. There are many things on there, and and thinking of all the things that aren't, I think, are appropriate and okay. Okay. Well, we can. <laughs> Sorry, go this ahead. Is sure, uh, this is Sharice. I was just going to um, recommend also uh, this. The slip is also in their um, types of supervision. They they recommend or not recommend. They require that any new screening or treatment activity that the assistant is doing, anytime it's a new thing they're learning, then it goes to direct. It, it can't be indirect. So it, it's kind of like a they also have a little trigger in there for as as the the licensee registrant learns some a new treatment or a new activity that the level of supervision goes up temporarily and then it goes back down. That kind of a um, reminder in there. I'm sorry. Did you did you say that it is or that you think it should be? I think that's what the the slippers have, and it's worth oh, um, looking at for uh, for this as well. So that way, supervisors know okay, every time, yeah, when I first get you, it's 90 days of immediate supervision. Um, and then after it, that, it's direct. But then anytime I bring in some new activity, it always needs to go up to direct or if you guys want it immediate, whichever way you're going to go. Um, I would say immediate. Yeah, so that every time it's a new task, hey, you need to be immediate supervision with your aid while it's a new task until they've 
you know, performed it enough that the supervisor feels they're competent and then it goes down to direct again or or indirect, depending what it is. Um, so I think there's sorry, definitely ways to make this open and um, useful, um, but also give a little clear guidelines and guide rails. Yeah, I think that that recommendation is is good and agree, Marcia, about it being immediate again. Um, there is a training of AIDS section under, it's a few pages back under the 1399.154.4, um, where it states the supervisor is not required to repeat any training, which may have already been received by the aid because of prior education training experience. So that would still apply this is for all AIDS, correct? Yes, that yeah. is current. In the case of, of audiology aids, of course, there's no formal education or training that they go through prior, although they might have been an aid for someone else, I suppose, and then came to your practice. Um, Sharice, I wanted to ask if there are other um, pieces of the SLIPA regulations that we might um, look at that you can think of that we might want to entertain us, because this is a good one about um, any new task. Are there other things like that that we're not as familiar with that we could borrow or adapt? Those are the ones that are sticking out in my head. I definitely, you can direct um, staff and I to go ahead and look through them and then bring any that we also find for the next meeting. So we can take these um, mocked up 2015 and then incorporate more changes, what we've talked about today, and then kind of go through and, and do a double check if there's any other provisions that might be helpful and then ask for how you want to implement it. Just like uh, you want immediate versus direct for that new task. I think that would be worthwhile because there are some good definitions in here. There's, there's also um, some information about um, medically fragile patients and the requirement for immediate supervision for medically fragile patients. Um, so maybe it's it's perfectly fine to do an ear mold impression um, or um, otoscopy. I'm, I'm guessing that's what would be okay normally, but maybe if you have someone who's on um, a lot of blood thinners or something else going on that might make them a little more med medically fragile, maybe the supervision level needs to go up or something along those lines, because that's also something that SLIPAs have, um, where if there's more medically fragile patients you need to move up to immediate or not. Um, you can define that. But those are those are kind of the big ones that usually stick out to me um, for the slippers. And then of course we'll also have the um, the supervisors in charge of training the aides and the continued competency part. So they just need to tell us about that. Um, and I know they're not below the audiologist, so the training provided by normal CE providers probably is not as applicable. Uh, can I ask the committee how they feel by just eliminating um, the possibility of indirect supervision? Um, I think the way it's defined here, indirect supervision, it's almost like it's just trying to say, Hey, you can do the functions of a regular office aide <laughs> when when the audiologist isn't there, right? Um, it, yes, that's kind of how I'm reading it. Is it just to cover bases to say, well, if the provider's not there, it's not that you can't work, but you just can't do, you know, these other patient care activities. You can do these normal office type of duties. I don't know if we feel if if that's necessary, but that's kind of the way I'm reading it. Oh, with the term supervision suggests that. Um, they aren't just filing or, or making phone calls. If if there's some form of supervision that that is possible, uh, I, I'm pretty uncomfortable with the idea of, of of an aide working doing any tasks with a patient with some with an audiologist who isn't on site. This my instinct tells me that's not a. It has a, too many potentials. I don't necessarily disagree, although it is linked directly then to that industrial aid. And yeah. so if indirect supervision is taken out, 
you know, while we may not, I don't like say personally have a knowledge of someone doing this industrial audiology right now using AIDS, we sure wouldn't want to eliminate something that there are people doing that we just, you know, because we don't know about it. So I think we would really need to look into that, explore that further as you brought up earlier. Yeah, I think we're going to do that. So we can revisit that idea once we know more <clears throat> about its applicability in California. And it may be as, as specifically stating indirect supervision is only allowed if, you know, for these industrial aids, if, if we end up needing to um, keep that. Mm -hmm. This is Sharice. You might also, um, because you might need it for that and also so that they know they can do office work. Because um, if, if you remove it all together, then they'll ask, well, what else can they, they do when I'm not there? So it provides that, but you could also clarify that indirect supervision is not allowed for any patient, direct patient care or direct patient interaction. Some, some, some way of defining that it can't be that unless it's the industrial audiology aid, then, then you're okay. So would they say, well, what if they call to make an appointment or they have a problem of, uh, connecting their hearing aid to the phone? Can I talk to them over the phone? Is that interaction? Up to you guys, I would say yes, but that's up to you guys. <laughs> but that's but that's any front office staff can yeah. do that, right? So, I mean, we don't want to make this where now we're trying to define every single possible thing they can do as, as what a normal front office person would be able to do. Front office people pair hearing aids to phones all the time. It's just Bluetooth. It has nothing to do with the hearing aid. It's just like pairing a, a watch to a phone or a car to a phone or something like that. So, you know, we don't want to... By trying to define, overly define it, we don't want to make it seem as if, you know, they can't perform the normal duties of an office, a front office person at the office when the audiologist isn't there. We could craft better language that would stipulate yeah. um, in-person um, patient care or interaction, mm -hmm. something like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Okay. Are there any more um, committee member comments, thoughts about this issue? Um, the only other request I would have is a consideration to perhaps give a sample plan. I mean, we're asking the audiologists to come up with this training plan and delineate how they're going to verify there's competency and, and how often that's going to be checked and et cetera, or for the renewal. Is there a, a worksheet that we're going to provide or are there samples that we could provide just so it's a little easier to understand what the board is asking of the supervisor? I think we would normally be putting it on a, a form that we would be telling in the regs what the form will include. Um, and then, of course, the board would provide a, a form that ma matches that those requirements. So we could add that in there. I don't because I don't believe in the past we had a um, I mean, there was like an application form but I don't recall there being a, a form for the training plan or a sample of what this training plan might look like, like what items should be on there and in what manner. To, maybe it would make it easier for board staff to review when they came in if they were similar um, or standardized in any way. Yeah, I don't believe so. But I think by, um, by tackling the issue that forms should probably be Forms should be in regs in one way or another, whether it's the actual form adopted by reference, which we don't want to do because then anytime you change some formatting thing on the form, you got to reopen the reg. Um, but you can put reg uh, forms and regulations where it tells the um, public and the licensing public, you know, what items all have to be in the application and explain what they mean. And then the ISOR explains it as well. And then you put that on the form. You know, the training plan needs to include blank and blank and blank that it needs to clearly define. These are the things that need to be included. And, you know, the board can provide an example or generic example. I believe I would need legal counsel to make sure I'm not doing uh, educational materials that end up being underground regs. But hopefully if we're doing the forms right, um, the language would tell the supervisor essentially what all needs to be included in there, and then we can always provide a sample. Great. Do we provide samples for other um, other licensees? No, um, most of them are not as um, open ended. Um, where there's kind of just a plan, and and the slip is they have their scope. They know what 
the scope is and they go off and do it, they don't really need to tell us their supervision plan compared to AIDS. So it's a little different. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think a sample plan, if, if that's acceptable, is a good idea. So we don't trap ourselves with. with yeah. We'll double check with legal on that. I, I, I won't want to tiptoe into underground regs or anything, but we'll make sure we can what we can provide um, based on the language. And, and that language isn't in here, so we would definitely need to develop that. Okay, are, are there any other uh, committee member comments? Okay, uh, seeing none, I'd like to ask that the moderator open for public comment on this issue. This is a moderator and at the direction of the committee, I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. And if you're an audio only participant, you can raise your hand by pressing star three on your device. I'll pause a moment to allow the public time to access these features and submit their requests. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, thank you. So the action requested is that um, staff recommends the committee uh, review, which we've done, um, all of the materials that we want to perhaps uh, direct staff to work with DCA Regulations Council to draft regulatory language that will begin clarifying the scope of practice and supervision for audiology aids as we've discussed today um, and any statutory uh, changes for audiology aids as well. Um, so we've talked about a lot of things that we want to put in here and our committee presumably can continue to work with board staff to try to flesh out and um, improve, um, clean up if you will, um, some of the, the regulatory language and bring this back to the next uh, board meeting in that form. Any further discussion of that idea? So it doesn't look like we need a motion to do that or do we? No, we do not, Dr. Rajo. Okay. This is legal counsel, Ken Swenson. I concur with that. Okay, thank you. And thanks for being here today. Okay, um, so let's move on to um, agenda item four. Uh, discussion and possible action regarding audiology licensing requirements related to supervised clinical and professional experience as stated in BPC codes 2532.2 and 2532.25 and Title 16 and uh, regulation section 1399.152.2. Another topic that we've been working on for some time now. Uh, let me read just a little of the background here about this. It's not as lengthy. Um, BMP code 2532.25B2 requires the submission of evidence of no less than 12 months of satisfactory completed supervision, um, supervised professional uh, full-time experience, RPE, or its part-time equivalent obtained under the supervision of a licensed audiologist. So um, what we're gonna talk about today is um, trying to update, uh, discuss, and, and provide possible action regarding the audiology licensing requirements related to the RPE. And in the past, this experience was completed under the direction of a board approved audiology program, which it still is, but the RPE shall follow completion of the didactic and clinical rotation requirements of the audiology doctoral program. So said another way is that students were not allowed to count any time and or hours um, uh, prior to completion of all of the coursework, all the didactic aspects of it. 
And it was our understanding as uh, directors of AUD programs came to the board saying this causes a hardship. It causes a hardship for the students, for the programs, um, because sometimes students completed their time uh, earlier than the 12 months, but had to continue to pay tuition uh, until the 12 months was met. Um, some There were visa requirements uh, that interfered with this, um, those kinds of problems. So we asked in the Sunset Review uh, to give us the discretion to not require all of that time and or hours to occur uh, post-didactic that it would could be in some of the rotations, the earlier clinical rotation time could be counted toward the 12 month. Um, so if you look at uh, page two of three um, of the memo, it says business and profession code section 2532.25. And you'll see at the um, bottom of two of A2, um, you'll see where it used to say the required professional experience shall follow completion of the didactic and clinical rotations and change to, um, that's simply been removed. So effective January 1st, 2023, the statute will allow audiology doctoral students the ability to start their 12 month RPE um, before the completion of the didactic and clinical rotation requirements. Um, so we, we realized that we needed some input from the people who actually operate these programs. Um, that is, we wanted to talk to the program directors and the clinical directors of all of the California AUD programs uh, to get their take on what was needed on their side um, to make their programs as, as comprehensive and uh, compliant with all uh, requirements, regulatory and statutory requirements for the AUD. At the same time, being well aware of what the legislature's goal was in developing the original regulations. We have to balance those two things. But one thing we decided to do was to send out a doctoral audiology program survey to all of the program directors and clinical directors. And uh, you'll see that, um, uh, that we sent that out and I think it was October, November. Let me look back when we sent that out. Um, October. Yeah, October. Um, and we requested that the survey be completed by December 31st, which it was, but by all except one program who subsequently did uh, submit their responses. We analyzed um, that data and while I don't want to read um, uh, every response, there are some main ones we'd like to look at. Um, so as you can see, we, we sent the survey to San Diego State University, University of California, San Diego's AUD program, University of the Pacific, a private program, San Jose State University, California State University, Los Angeles, Cal State University, Northridge, and Cal State University, Sacramento. And I would point out that um, these are among these uh, uh, universities, there are three different management models um, that are operating here. And thus, we're going to have some differences in how they view um, the questions and, and th their subsequent responses. So there's just a few that I marked that I'm, I might want to point out that were somewhat surprising to us in some ways and, and others um, uh, got us thinking more about it. And just looking at, at number six, for example, the idea that um, students had to be exposed to three different clinical settings, uh, we thought surely people would want to get rid of that. Um, but actually the, the consensus response, and you, if it is a consensus, you'll see that, that phrase there. Uh, they said no, <laughs> because they already work in um, more than three settings and it's just unnecessary to remove it. Um, because they always meet it and exceed it. Uh, so we'll have to consider whether it's worth just leaving alone or if we want to do anything about it. And without a number seven, without a specified number of different uh, setting requirements, how would your program verify the clinical rotations provide sufficient clinical practice with individuals representative of a wide spectrum of ages and audiological disorders as it currently states? 
And the vast majority said we simply follow accreditation requirements, particularly those from CAA or ASHA. And they use a, a tracking program called Calypso. That's very common. Um, how many clinical rotations are, quite, are required prior to the start of the externship? And generally, people said it varies, but it's generally seven to nine types. And um, San Diego gave us a very clear breakdown of how their uh, clinical hours in number nine are earned in each rotation. You can see the lion's share are still um, only about 29% are earned in years one through th three, with about 71% earned in the fourth year. Um, and it, again, we, we that was the general consensus from most of the programs. Uh, sh then I'm just gonna jump down to 13. Should tracking of supervised clinical rotation hours and externship hours distinguish when the hours are performed by simulation? That was an important issue, especially during COVID because that's what they had to do. Um, but the accrediting body, that is CAA, um, uh, I forget that stands for Committee on uh, Academic Accreditation, something like that. Um, they stipulate 10% of is all that's allowable. ACAE doesn't stipulate at all. Uh, number 15, for the supervised professional experience or externship, should the regulations limit the number of hours allowed for certain activities? And the consensus was no. That is dictated by the accreditation bodies and we don't need to make any stipulations. Now, number 16 is I think one of the thornier um, elements here. And that is, should the regulations allow some of the time and hours of clinical rotations to account toward the 12 month uh, professional experience RPE required for licensure? As I read the responses, the majority of them said that um, yes, that all hours from the very beginning, so long as they are supervised by a, a licensed audiologist, um, they should count toward the RPE. There was one that kind of stood out to me and that is Cal State LA, um, at this point anyway, said no earlier rotations are not part of it. So I'm not sure if they, um, subsequent discussions uh, suggest that they mean the RPE should stay as it is, um, because only, by adding the earlier rotations, you would add very little time, 29% of their time, uh, which would be, I don't know, uh, two months, perhaps cut off the regular, solid, continuous, contiguous um, uh, RPE. Uh, number 17, at what year in your program would it be appropriate to begin allowing clinical rotation hours to count toward the 12 months? And the consensus response is don't count any hours we don't want any hours in, uh, in the um, regulations at all. We can have time, we can have whatever makes up the 12 months, but no hours per se. Um, it uh, is a number 18 is a uh, 12 consecutive month experience required by your accreditation body. And the, the uh, consensus response is no experience over the program year. So it doesn't have to be Continuous. It doesn't have to be consecutive months. Um, yeah, especially if there's cases of, of students having to go on medical leave or something like that. Number 19, should the regulations restrict the ability to accrue RPE hours until after preliminary clinical rotations? And most of them say, uh, no, you should, um, requirements should be in the 11th or 12 month um, RPE year only. Um, where others, uh, there is this dichotomy there. Some people want it to all hours to count, or not hours that are counted, but time counted um, well, through that, the whole program. And others say, no, let's leave it as the RPE. Uh, that is the fourth year or the third year, depending on which program we're talking about. Um, I'm going to jump over to 23. How does your program handle students on federal visas, which had been one of the initial complaints of why we needed to change our regulations to allow clinical rotations prior to, to completion of didactic and clinical rotations to be the only time when you could start counting time uh, because federal visas often student had to leave, uh, had to leave the country after 11 months. And that was a big problem. Uh, but according to the survey responses, it says not an issue. 
first of all, they thought wasn't a limit and others would uh, offer to help the students with their extending their visas. So what had been a problem uh, and a motivation for changing it is uh, apparently not there. 25, what's the average level of supervision provided during the supervision? The consensus is the current language is eight hours of direct supervision per month. There's some variation on that, but most of them stick with that. Uh, 26C, if any, are there restrictions required by accrediting body? Um, oh, it has to do with the, the um, simulations only being 10%. That's the only, and that's only with CAA. Uh, what type of clinical activity during the externship dictate the percentage of supervision? And um, it doesn't matter what type it is, according to the consensus, it is site determined. And that was question 27. 28, when is the, when in the program does the externship begin? The consensus is third or fourth year. Uh, 30, does your program track externship hours to verify that all externship hours have been completed? per program requirements, and they said yes, only not hours, but 12 month clinical experience. So those are the main ones that I called out. So I, you, you'll see on page eight of eight is kind of a summary of at least the preliminary findings of this survey. And that is that the California AUD programs would prefer to eliminate any particular clinical or clock hour requirement. Rather, since all programs are accredited by the Council on Academic Accreditation by ASHA, which turns out to be not the case, by the way, uh, which does not require or stipulate a fixed number of clinical hours for AUD programs, the programs like to require only the students com complete an 11 or 12 month experience over the course of their programs in order to meet the RPE requirement. The Accreditation Commission on Audiology Education for AAA requires neither a stipulated number of hours nor clinical time experiences over the course of an AUD program. Tom Muller, who's the past chair of CFCC, the, the credentialing, um, or certification, I'm sorry, committee for ASHA recommends the following language. Students must complete the equivalent of 12 months of full-time clinical experience. So some of our um, survey uh, respondents mentioned 11 to 12 months. When I asked Mr. Muller whether 11 months would be acceptable, he said no, that, that the requirement is clear that it's 12 months. So I'm not sure um, where that breakdown occurs or if they consider it one. Number two, the programs would prefer to count all the clinical time during which students are involved in supervised activities by licensed audiologists as time counted toward the 11th or 12 month requirement over the course of an AUD program. I've since learned that not all programs um, support that idea. They'd rather see it since there isn't much in, in terms of time that one can gain um, prior to the completion of the didactics, um, that it wouldn't be worth calling out allowing that and then still having them have to complete seven months of a continuous um, AUD or uh, RPE experience. Um, also, when we asked, um, how would you differentiate between um, clinical experience and professional experience? It seemed pretty clear that the professional experience begins with the RPE in its entirety. Number three, a program's clinical activities are designed to meet the accreditation requirements. The amount of time during which students are performing these activities are tracked by the programs. Generally, more supervision is provided for earlier clinical experiences rather than later clinical activities when students have gained experience and can operate more independently. The externship sites determine the clinical time and type of activity depending upon the complexity of the tasks and the site policies. Number four, since students gain experience in essentially every aspect of clinical audiology throughout the time in their programs, stipulating a fixed number of required clinical settings is no longer relevant. However, this requirement can remain and be required on the clinical verification form. The number and type of settings are tracked by the program to meet accreditation requirements if stated. Number five, simulations, telehealth, and general clinical experiences are tracked by the programs such that accreditation stipulations for time requirements are met. The board does not need to maintain <clears throat> any tracking records of student activity. Number six, allowable non-direct patient time is determined by accreditation standards. So looking at these preliminary findings, I'd like to open the uh, discussion to the audiology practice committee members.
I guess I have one initial question here, Marcia, which is uh, it looked like in the sunset mm, that it's already in there under 2532.25 that the board shall establish by regulation the required number of clock hours um, for an applicant. So despite the fact that the programs don't feel the state needs to be clocking the hours because they're tracking clock hours. Are we committed to that at this point? Do we, are we needing to track clock hours because of this? That's a good question. Sharice <laughs> or Paul, do you want to? Yes, I, uh, I could just comment on that. Right now there is, the board has established a number of clock hours. That, that clock, that number is from when the audiology programs or master's programs, and I want to say it's in the 300s, and we know that the number of clock hours uh, or the number of hours is, is much more than that. But it's true. In, in the law, it does state that, you know, the board is required to establish a number of clock hours, and I think that the consensus was just leave the number alone because we know that we already exceed what that number is. And, and as, as Dr. White pointed out, um, which I agree with, we already have statutory requirements. And, and one of the other statutory requirements that conflicts with the answers is that the, the applicants must submit evidence of no less than 12 months of satisfactorily completed supervised professional full-time experience. So they actually have to complete 12 months, not 11 to 12 months. So uh, would the notion be that just leaving the 300 as is would be advisable uh, since everybody exceeds that without question? I would also mention that we should update the regulation 1399.152.2 so that it appropriately references 2532.25 because it currently, it doesn't reference it, but it, it's extended to it um, just because we never changed once 2.25 was added. So we should at least make that clarifying change. Okay. And and actually, uh, this is Paul again, this is what actually started us on this whole discussion <laughs> because technically we haven't identified the number of clock hours that address 2532.25. So thanks, Sharice, for that. That That's a, that's an important point. You know, we, we, we could change the reference and technically be covered. Um, or do we want to identify a minimum number of clock hours that more accurately um, reflects what is actually being done in the programs? Well, as I understand it, they they don't count hours per se. Um, I don't know if they actually internally do. Well, we can ask when we get to public comment if that is the case. Uh, but they count time. And I think I mean, our for that. Are you referring, sorry, Marcia, to the RPE or prior? Uh, prior. The RPE. Gotcha. But it seems when I when I speak with the CFCC personnel that there is no requirement. They do say that the full time equivalent, twelve months, functionally means eighteen hundred and twenty hours. However, they don't stipulate that in in written language in their in their uh, regulations. But that's, well, that was, what, that's an underground no, uh, notion. Number. Well, and that was going to be my question because I think this is the my personal experience with having students even from out-of-state programs is this is the argument. Well, what is full-time? I mean, is full-time considered 40 hours a week for 52 weeks? That's, a, you know, around 2,000 hours. Or is it 36 hours a week at 1,800 hours? Or is it 30 hours a week at 1,500 hours? So, um you know, while we may not want to track hours per se, it may be of benefit to define what's considered full time. Is that an average of 30 hours a week, an average of 40 hours a week or, or what that what that means? I don't know. Yeah, well, that's a good point. I, I believe when we uh, gain some public comment here, we'll, we'll learn exactly how they do it to verify that they have indeed um, met some full-time, but what full-time is. Um, I don't think it's 40 hours a week, but I don't know for sure. 
um, my instinct from looking at some of the survey data is it isn't uh, completely that, but it is fairly full time. But we do need to, to stipulate what that means. How do you feel about the notion that if, if we start counting all time prior to, from the start of the program forward, and it only amounts to um, a, let's say up to a third of the RPE require, time requirement, is that helpful to be able to count that? Does, is it helpful to the student? Um, does it get them out of the program sooner? Do they save money on tuition? Uh, if they were able to do that, um, I, I don't know the answers to those things. Um, I know that the CSU programs, they have an 11 semester mandate um, and they meet that mandate with the last three semesters being dedicated to the RPE and would be happy to leave it that way. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to engender some discussion here about that issue among our committee members. Yeah, I, oops, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Dr. Wayne. I was just going to say, I, I think that's an interesting notion, you know, okay, if if we only need to do a nine-month rotation now for the RPE, is the school going to reduce the program by a semester and therefore reduce the tuition requirement on the student? I, I believe they still have some sort of didactic or, or capstone project type of requirement going in a lot of those years, so I'm not sure that that would impact the tuition side, reducing the RPE. I, um, as someone who's taken RPEs for many, many years, um, I f it could wreak havoc on the schedule. I mean, how do you, unless all the schools are doing it exactly the same, you know, when you have a, a paid externship slot, like at the VA, for example, you know, it's for that 12 month period. And then you can't just, the, the person can't just leave in the middle of the 12 month period because they've finished um, their their requirement. And then, you know, you, you now have no worker there with you for three months and then you get the next one in. And so wreaking havoc on like the rotation schedule of externs, I think is something to, um, would be an impact, you know, whether that matters to us as the board or not, I don't know, but um, it, it, it might get a little tricky. <clears throat> I agree that it could. Are we, any, anyone else on the committee who would like to um, chime in? Would it be okay to bring up another issue? Of course. Um, I, I wanted to first address right now on the application, we the, the board uses full time as um, 30 hours or over per week. Um, just using general labor law um, uh, is what we've done. And then part-time is 29 to 15. Um, and then, you know, if it's a, we don't really allow the per diem type unless it's on top of a, another experience um, currently. Um, that's one part. Um, the other thing that we've run into and in, in the, the, the legislative staff had questions about is how come they, how come students could be ready to do the RPE but can't start? Um, and so I, that was one of the points of, you know, processing times, right? Um, the current, the old statute didn't let them start the experience um, until they were done with the clinical and didactic. Um, and therefore we needed the training programs or, or the, the directors to sign off that the student would be done on this date. And so by the time you get everything ready and turned in, and then you're in our processing time queue, it was it was cause potentially delays. You were ready, but you weren't issued the license yet, so you couldn't start. Um, so there was, you know, you can start counting the 12 months. Um, so then there there's the question now, um, if it doesn't have to follow the did didactic and clinical rotations, technically it doesn't have to follow it. Um, maybe they could apply sooner a little sooner, you know, like we know they're going to be ready three to six months from now or three months from now. So let's go ahead and sign off. This is when they'll be ready and get their application in the queue along with their supervisor and get it all ready so that they're ready and issued and ready and approved and, and ready for issuance 
far prior to their experience starting. So that way there's also no delays in starting that 12 month clock. How long is that delay? It depends on the time of the year with the hardest part being that, um, you know, speech language pathologists are the biggest population and everybody's coming in around the same time in the summer. So, uh, you know, June, June looks at about a month, normally uh, a month, four to six weeks. Um, and then suddenly July and the rest of the summer into the fall, the numbers go up because it just comes in like a huge wave <laughs> at the board. Um, all the SLPs, all the, the audiology students, um, everybody needing to start their RPE, the regular applications that are coming through, as well as uh, SLPA program graduates. And, and so it, it compounds in those summers to fall months on the normal, um, just every year. Um, and so there is that other just technicality part, you know, um, about applying. And if it doesn't have to follow that, even if the program is going to essentially have them follow it, they, they we no longer have this stipulation that they need to be done before we can issue or, or approve it. Okay. I'm sure there's some accommodation we could make to, to that policy. <coughs> So in earlier conversations I had with Paul and Charisse about what the legislature wanted of these licensees for consumer protection reasons, was it appropriate to count early on early program experiences when they truly are learning and not, not demonstrating any expertise nor expected to um, would would meet that idea of professional experience. Um, I guess I just want to throw that out there for some thoughts uh, from the committee or Paul and Charisse on if we said, okay, let's let's let uh, any time accrued so long as it's supervised, that would be okay. If, if those programs who, that wanted to do that could, and those programs that didn't could start their RP as they do traditionally. Uh, would that be, would that meet the legislature's um, intent? But if we clarified, <laughs> thank you, Sharice, that we're saying 30 hours a week is full time, then we're only talking about just over 1,500 hours, right, to complete the 12 months. And so if the, if they're counting up to, what was it, 700, Marsha, in some of the programs the first few years? Something like that, yeah. Uh -huh. So now we'd be saying potentially half of their pr required professional experience would be met before they complete their internship rotations or at the at the end of their internship rotations, they'd already be halfway meeting that requirement. So I, I do think that that's kind of interesting to look at when you when with what you're saying, you know, are we going to say that counting from day one on an internship rotation is counting towards required professional experience? And now we're saying, well, okay, well, they get 50% of their required professional experience completed before they're really more independently working out in their externship. Right? Survey tried to get at that and tried to say, if you would agree that earlier rotations are wouldn't be considered professional experience, because they're just learning many of these tasks for the first time. There's no expertise whatsoever, but perhaps in the second or third year when they have more experience, um, they, that we might consider adding those uh, or allowing uh, any, any kind of time that's experienced then as counting toward the RPE. But generally the feeling was um, either you count it all from the start because that's uh, that's okay with the accreditation body or you stick to the way it is now. And that is uh, a continuous 12 months um, post didactic. So I, <laughs> that's another conundrum here. Are there any Oh, sorry, go ahead. Just as staff, I would interject in that, you know, the legislative, the legislature wasn't willing to entertain counting all. So they, they still wanted the split between the clinical hours and the professional hours. So we have that complication on top of it too. So. It was that in sunset, you mean? Or yeah. Yeah. In sunset. 
So making sure I am uh, uh, following that. So they've stated in the sense that, that they do want to separate. Um, they, that's why they, they wouldn't go to just an hours requirement as well. So that they're, they're, they want that B1 that's clinical hours and then B2 that's professional hours. So they they weren't moving on that as well. So. But they don't stipulate when B2 hours or the Start. nature of the yeah. B2 hours. Exactly. That's where we can define it in regulations. What are clinical clock hours versus professional uh, full-time experience hours and what differentiates them? Would it be <clears throat> advantageous then based on your earlier comment there, Sharice, about the the timing to try and apply so they can get ready to go so they can start their 12 month, you know, on time and not be delayed um, to somehow massage it where the final semester prior to that RPE, you know, either counts or, or something where it allows you to make that where they can be putting those applications in a semester out. That's what I think would help most students and that way they're already pre-approved with a future start date. Um, and that way it's kind of, they're already through the queue. They know they're approved to start their thing on the date that they have uh, said they're gonna start on. Um, it'll issue on that date and it gets them going from there. Um, and I, I think that will help quite a few students. Um, and I think as long as we're very clear about, you know, when should the, since that, didactic and clinical rotation requirement is now stricken. Um, we just need to, for the program directors to know, you know, in that last semester before the RPE experience, go ahead and have them apply, certify that they've got the number of hours they need, which, you know, current current regulations is only 300, so they're obviously good, um, and, and certify it, get everything ready to go. I don't know if that it conflicts with programs and how they're setting up their experiences, if they'll have the supervisors ready or not. Um, but that could be one way to help ease the pipeline. And that way the RPEs don't lose any time, just kind of stuck waiting. Is there any complication if their RPE site has not been established or determined? That would be the problem. We need to know their site and their supervisor. That can always change. Um, they, it does happen quite often. Um, I don't know about it with RP audiology, but it happens quite often with RPEs in general is that um, they set one up and then, you know, they say, I have a future start date. I, I applied in April, um, but I don't start until July. And somewhere in between we get an email. Um, oh, but my supervisor inside has changed. It's going to be this. So, and we just change it before it issues. Because our, our system that issues will have to, it'll, it'll be set to issue later. So it'll be approved. They know it's approved, but it's just not issued until later. Hmm. Okay. I think some work needs to be done on that. Um. If we, <laughs> if we move to something like that model where it let them kind of at least on the paperwork side, start that process a little earlier. Would it help on the back end in terms of completing the RPE where there could be more <clears throat> um, ability to move directly into their job, you know, upon completion of the RPE without there being a delay of a month, you know, waiting for the license to come through? I would think that would help a lot of students, yeah. That's usually the biggest calls we get. They need to start. It's been delayed. And of course, everybody's coming to us all at once. <laughs> so. Is there any consensus among the committee, uh, practice committee uh, members, that we leave the 300 hours as is because they always exceed it? And that would... <clears throat> save us some work on trying to change that language. Any thoughts on that? I'm fine with that. I think that's a good idea. Dr. Valdez, do you have, a, do you have an opinion? No, no okay. opinion on that. 300 hours seems okay. Okay. Um, of course, the big issue is this, is this difference between a, 
allowing these earlier hours does appear to not be what the legislative intent is, um, even though that is what the accrediting bodies are are allowing. Um, what do we have some thoughts, opinions about that among the committee members? I don't disagree. I I don't believe as a student, you know, in terms of a professional experience, not a clinical experience, but a professional experience that, you know, those first uh, couple of rotations, there, there's much of that. Um, I, you know, it's so heavily supervised, so heavily handheld. Um, you're just learning. I, I don't think that that learning time really translates well to being a professional experience in the beginning. Um, I'm with you, Marsha. I don't know where where that delineation is of, of when it does become more of a professional experience. And does that start before the initiation of the RPE? Probably. Um, but where where would we draw that line and, and how would we justify that unless it's based on as the survey has had here with these responses, you know, what the level of supervision is, you know, in year one versus two versus three um, being different. And it doesn't look like, at least when San Diego um, delineated it out, that there's much difference in supervision until that um, that final year right before the RPE. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, makes this very logical um, yep. how they're doing it. Um, I think we're going to learn more uh, from public comments here about how how they look at it and um, and how how they handle a situation. I'm thinking of there's always kind of students who get it and they're very proficient right away, and they really don't need much handholding from perhaps early on even. But how do you manage them? You can't manage them differently than you manage this the students who don't quite. Uh, who need a little more support before they get to um, being called uh, able to do professional experience. So hopefully they'll address that as well. Any other committee members with uh, thoughts about that issue? Should we allow the, or, or should the programs be allowed to have um, count any hours? Is, is that meet the legislative intent? Um, is, is there enough, is it worth doing? So I'm not seeing any uh, committee member um, comments coming up about that um, at this point. So I would like to ask um, that the moderator open for public comment on this issue. This is the moderator and at the direction of the committee, I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. It looks like we do have a request uh, for comment from Jody Winselberg. And uh, let me see, find you in my attendee list. There you are. Okay. Um, please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, I just want to thank the board for this discussion. Um, and I, I, I'm i with the other, uh, the three, two of the other programs on text. We're having a lot of Wi-Fi problems and I seem to be the only one with good audibility. So um, I have uh, CSULA and San Diego with me on text and myself, and we're we're here to help clarify and kind of help with some of the confusion. I, I do want to say that I think that part of the confusion here and some of the, the difficulty the board is having is that some of the requests to the legislators were made before the programs were actually surveyed to find out what we actually do. Um, and so that may be part of the problem, but I love the way you're thinking about it. And I, I think a lot of what some of you are saying is what we all want to see happen. Um, so the survey in itself was a little confusing. There were a variety of questions that asked the same thing, but in different ways. And so because of that, what all of the programs did was we came together and, and produced a letter for, uh, for you, Dr. Raggio and the board 
to understand what we what we felt was was what you should be looking at and and what that was is we appreciate the 300 hours being in there and we think they should stay we appreciate that the three different sites are in there because as you said we do more than three different sites and certainly more than 300 hours we agree with the legislators that we shouldn't be counting the pre fourth year hours towards the RPE. What we're asking for is that the pre RPE hours are, are used to get to the 300 hours, you know we exceed that. And then the RPE would begin and that the only thing that the RPE would be, would be, an, an, well, we said 11 to 12 months because we did understand um, from especially UOP that there was some visa issues there, but I know Marsha commented on that, so I, I can't speak to what the accrediting body said about the 11 month old criteria, the 11 month criteria, but the only criteria we're asking for is to have that be a 12 month full-time RPE. And Sharice was correct. The hours of full-time are already stipulated on your RPE form. Um, additionally, Sharice, we would certainly very much appreciate your comment about just asking us when the RPE will begin on the RPE form. Uh, I think all of the programs are uh, working with their students to submit the form in March because of the obvious you know, uh, amount of work that the board has to process three different disciplines, you know, during the same time, we were hoping that the form would just say, when is the anticipated start date? And we would sign off on that. And then to address your concerns about changing supervisors, audiologists know who their RPE supervisors are in the November before the year they start. So all of our students have been accepted for their RPE. The, the, um, the timeline is they interview in August and September, and then the final um, uh, uh, hiring, so to speak, or the final uh, match with an RPE setting is done October and latest November. So I just wanted you guys to have that background information that might help with some of the questions you have. Can I just ask? If, if that's true of all the programs that the interviews occur in August, September, supervisors are known by November without fail? Yes, uh, there, there is, Ian Windmill um, has uh, uh, started to organize audiology in the same way that medical students are organized because we found that there are some places that, you know, try to get the students earlier but generally not later. Um, and there is a preponderance of RPE sites and all of the AUD programs that I know have signed on to this ACAE um, timeline uh, for, it's kind of like a matching program, if you will. Um, so we're all abiding by that right now. Okay. I'm, I'm, I can also add, Marcia, that the VA, we're, we're following that as well. Okay. Happy to answer any other questions that you may have. And, and um, yeah, Marsha, I don't know whether if the letter that we sent to you um, addresses this, if, if maybe if did the, the committee get to see that letter, because we kind of put our, took our survey responses and made it into a really simple document um, that we hope that the board uh, was able to appreciate. And if you have any questions about that, I'm here to answer them uh, for our group. In all honesty, I can tell you that I saw it. I don't know uh, who else on the committee saw it. I presume everybody, but I don't know. Would do you think that that would be helpful to to share that document so that they could see the consensus of opinion from every AUD program in the state? Because you think it it varies significantly from the survey responses. No, I, I think it consolidates some of the questions because I still hear this conversation about hours towards RPE. And I think we were pretty clear and perhaps we weren't. So maybe it would be good to review it. I, I think, think we I, I try to be pretty clear that I also know that that is not what people want. I exactly. No, you so. did. You did. You absolutely did. And I think that that's accurate. But I still hear other people making comments about it. So I, that's why I'm I'm just trying I, I to... I think it's it's in the old vernacular and we're in the habit of saying uh, that. Okay. We always have to correct it and not say that. 
Um, okay. Jody, would you mind going back to repeat something you said earlier? Sure. You said that something about the early rotations could count toward the 300? No, no, oh. no, no. So, 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 so the 300 hours um, would be prior to RPE. Um, I can tell you the preponderance of those hours are obtained uh, towards the latter half because we increase the number of days that they're having clinically. But we don't want any of those hours to count towards the RPE. We want those hours to count towards the 300 needed to begin the RPE. So we're in line with the legislators. We, we don't think those are professional hours. We think those are learning hours, clinical learning hours. And so we're asking that there's 300 clinical learning hours that need to be, that the, the, the hours that are currently listed in the regulations that state that 300 clinical hours need to be obtained prior to starting the RPE, that we continue along that line because we think that the current regulations we have they protect the consumers in California. And that we agree that the required professional uh, experience is a professional experience. We shouldn't count hours at all. And we should make it what the accreditation bodies are asking for, which is 12 month full-time experience. Okay, so let me just clarify if you have San Diego there with you that- I do. <clears throat> that you are on board with that notion that the early time, not the hours, but the time dedicated to earlier clinical rotations, say from day one of the program, would not be a part of the full-time professional experience. Correct. No hour requirement for the full-time professional Not, not hour, but time. If, if we say 12 months. No time. Yes, that's right, Marcia. Thank so you for clarifying. They would You're not right. want to count those early rotations as part of that 12 month time. We all want to, for the 12 month rotation to start in year four for the CSUs, in year three for UOP. Okay, well, that's that's um, that's very good. That's not the takeaway that, that I had from some of the, the survey responses. So I think Cherise may be trying to. Yay, there it is. Thank you, Cherise. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. There it is. Apologies. And I realized I'm muted. I'm so sorry. I was trying to share this and then I think you guys got my, <laughs> my screen no and then it wasn't the right one. And no worries. This is great, Cherise. I, I think maybe we could take a minute, let the committee review this, and then I'm happy to address any questions that you have. I guess the bullet point number two, uh, we recommend the current requirement of a 12 month RPE to be amended to reflect the suggested 11 to 12 month full-time equivalent. Uh, it, that language is still vague to me in terms of, are you saying that you want some of the time pre-didactic to be counted toward the 12 month RPE. You just no. explained to me, Jody, that that's not what you'd no, say. No, that's not what I'm saying. And Marsha, I think maybe perhaps we were unaware of what you stated earlier in the meeting that you spoke to somebody from an accreditation board that said absolutely not 11 months, it has to be 12. So the 11 month um, kind of uh, bone we were throwing was because we thought that there was an issue and and I think that UOP had the preponderance of international patients and they had were they originally the ones who brought this up yeah um, and that there was some kind of an visa issue um, that made it difficult so that was where that came from uh, but if the accrediting bodies don't allow that at all that was not something that I was aware of and I can't say that anyone else here was either. Okay, so in, in listening to this discussion, it, it almost feels like we shouldn't change much of anything. That's kind of what we felt because uh, we felt that the regulations as they stood really protected the, the citizens of California and the consumers and that the AUD programs were really following all the accreditation you know, uh, rules. And so 
Yeah, we. That's why I think that the the issue happened is because you guys went for sunset review, but we hadn't had an opportunity to weigh in on the survey yet, and so it was kind of a little out of order, maybe, and that caused a little bit of confusion. Well, it it wasn't out of order in the sense that we met with AUD program directors pr well before the sunset review, uh, because they came to us and said, "This is a problem. These regulations are a problem for us. These statutes." Uh, we have these various circumstances that for which these requirements interfere. So students are having to stay longer. They can't, they have to pay tuition. They can't get a job. Uh, they're having visa problems. That's where this started. I remember that, Marcia. No, you're absolutely right. I remember that. And that may be some people who are no longer uh, part exactly. of the AUD programs. And, and so that's why we tried to get a consensus of the current leadership mm -hmm. so that we really understood you know, what the current leadership who are conducting these courses believe to be the issue. Now, I, I, someone made a comment, I think it was Amy, um, but I 100% agree that there is an issue with, uh, you know, the delay in getting the licensure. And so what Amy had said about, you know, trying to make sure that when they finish the RPE, they can be licensed to begin working right away. That would be a, an amazing uh, thing for the board to be able to accomplish for our students. Um, Again, I'm not sure about this 11 month restriction that you're, I mean, I believe you when you say someone told you that, I don't know that we were aware of that. So if it needs to stay 12 months because you're being told by the accreditation bodies they won't allow it, then it needs to stay 12 months. We were hoping there was some flexibility there because we did understand that some international students were having some difficulty, but not all. And you know, I can't speak from experience because San Jose has their first international student this cohort and she's from Canada and it's the, for her first year. So we haven't run into it yet. Um, I did invite Mr. Muller, who is the past chair of CFCC to be here today to explain that 12 month and unfortunately he wasn't available. Oh, okay. Uh, but I would refer you to him um, because he seems to have his finger on that pulse uh, pretty well. Okay. But I think you're accurate and, and I think you can see by our letter, Marcia, we're, we're not asking for any additional requirements or changes as part of the RPE process. The only thing we would like to do is we would like to submit our applications in March with a start date of June because we all start our RPEs in the summer semester in June. And we would just like to be able to you know, note that we have all the RPE supervisors the November before. Um, yeah, things happen, things change, but that's just, you know, handing in a change of form if something should happen, like, you know, somebody gets sick or somebody loses their job or whatever. Um, that's going to happen, but the preponderance of assignments are established in the fall prior to the beginning of the RPE. Okay, that sounds like a, um, a, a needed and important thing to do, and we'll certainly be working on how to make that uh, happen. Thank you. Um, are there any other um, public members who would like to comment? Uh, this is a moderator of a couple. Oh, uh, it looks like just one hand uh, raised now. Um, from Melanie Rosenblatt. And uh, Melanie, please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. Okay, you are unmuted. Great. Um, I just wanted to comment. I agree with a lot of... Um, what Jody has mentioned about the requirement for hours and the the dates established. Um, I'm fairly new. I work at University of the Pacific, and the only I would say instance of noted that's been very different as far as timeline has just been regarding a student of ours who is pursuing um, an RPE experience uh, with the a branch of the military. Their timelines just happen to be a little bit different, but otherwise, I I very wholly agree with uh, what Jody has said. What what is their timeline? Um, they were granted. They were accepted. Maybe three or four weeks ago. Very uncharacteristically late because all of our other students, maybe with an exception of one, were done and ready to go by Halloween, if not Thanksgiving. So it was the start time. You mean the twelve month is still the twelve month. 12 months is still 12 months, but that this student had not been able to secure um, this this placement um, until maybe three or four weeks ago because of military timelines. So they have to continue to pay tuition to complete that? 
No, I think he'll be able to start just as everybody else starts. His application for the RPE though couldn't be couldn't be started until okay. much more recently. Okay. Can I ask public members, this is okay to do, um, the, my feeling from the CAA is they want you to count hours all along. And how do you, those of you who are accredited by CAA, how do you feel if you continue to say, we're just going to start it post didactically? Any comment on that? Uh, this is the moderator. I have a couple of raised hands. Um, I'm going to um, go with um, Jody Winselberg, who had her hand raised first. Um, so, Jody, uh, please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. Thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah, Marsha, I, I think what we're trying to say is if people want to be ASHA certified is different than what CAA is requiring. Um, and, and it's difficult because CAA is separate from the RPE, right? So what CAA is requiring for ASHA, you know, it, I don't think any of the programs in California the goal of the programs in California are to get students ready to be licensed in the state of California. None of our uh, programs guarantee that a student is gonna be able to get their C's going through this program, although we support any student that wants to. So we set up uh, Calypso with the supervisors to understand who is ASHA certified as a supervisor and who aren't and those uh, CCC hours are not and do not have anything to do with RPE hours as far as the programs are concerned. Now, perhaps ASH is looking at those hours and deciding when, you know, th those hours that ASHA uses to uh, award a CCC are obtained during the 12 month externship. Um, and then they have pre-hours uh, before the externship, but that has nothing to do with the RPE or with getting licensed in the state of California. That's a certification from a national organization. It's a different conversation, I think. I know, but Mr. Mueller is pretty adamant that um, all hours should count. Well, all Mr. Hours. Mueller, maybe, I don't, is he currently in charge of this? Because he was, the, he's the past chair, he was chair yeah, last. We should look at the current chair and the current rules because I believe they've changed. And I don't know that we should be relying on Mr. Mueller to give us the current state of things. Just, that's just my opinion. I would say San Diego would, would know. Uh, San Diego if, is on the line, I believe. Let me ask her if she's, if she was unable to join, hold on. But I can certainly check with current leadership. I don't want yeah, to. Yeah, I would, Marsha. Honestly, I would. I wouldn't rely on somebody because uh, see, the, the Council for Accredi Academic Accreditation has changed their standards. So he may or may not be, you know, informed. Well, I, I, he seems pretty on top of things and is very knowledgeable. And it's actually San Diego who referred me to him. Uh, let that, me that was a year ago. That yeah, ago. That, let me see if Christy's available. Uh, this is the moderator. Looks like um, Christy has her hand yeah. raised. So, um, Christy, um, if you could please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm sorry I was um, not able to join uh, the meeting at the beginning. Um, uh, Tom Mueller is. Uh, Definitely an expert on this, whether he is the current um, person or not. Um, I, I would still, uh, Jody, uh, defer to his knowledge on this. You got he's, it. He's a wealth of information. Um, and I, while this was going on, I was trying to pull up my um, notes regarding this. It's really, really confusing. And I hesitate to speak without looking at my notes because the requirements uh, from ASHA and uh, CAA uh, have changed, right. um, like you said, and I, I get them confused. 
um, in terms of who who is wanting what. Um, my understanding, though, is that um, the uh, <laughs> we it's uh, I have to look at my notes honestly. the The way that it's worded is odd. It looks, if I'm being honest, like Asha has. Um, try to act like they're not requiring the hours and when in fact they actually are if you dig down deep into the information. Um, but that's why we have program requirements based on the accrediting bodies. So we require the hours. Uh, we don't need the state to require the hours. Does that make sense? And you equate that to, to time. Yes, uh, we count the hours in our program. San Diego does. Um, and that's a program requirement. For the RPE, we we don't need the state to track hours. We just need to track time. Yes, we understand that. Yeah, okay. But do our, do our, does your program count uh, time from the beginning of entry into your program or uh, as... I, I don't know how they stick to the program time versus RPE time. No, we track we track time. Um, uh, we track time per student in every setting across four years, and we have program requirements for graduation that are based on our understanding of accreditation requirements. Does that equate to twelve months? Some of the twelve month RPE time is is provided by early rotations then? No, not the time, no. The, the time that we need 12 months in a, for, for us, a fourth year placement. Okay, okay. Yeah, um, our counting time has to do with acc accreditation. Uh, it's, so that's internal and reported to CAA. Can I just ask your opinion in my discussions with Mr. Muller, He's suggesting that um, all time should be counted. Is that your understanding as well? Yes. In fact, that's where I first understood that um, all time should. Well, you know what? We counted all time previously. It was in talking with him about two years ago that I realized that that is the way that we should be doing it. And we were. So all time counts for our program requirement to meet accreditation but not all, we don't need to track time for the RPE. I see. Okay. Thank you for explaining that. I, I certainly we don't need to track hours for the RPE. We need to track time. Time. There. Yes. I'm sorry. Okay. That's helpful to, to understand that. Did I say that right, Jody? Yes, you okay. did. Thank you for correcting it. That's absolutely what we all do. Okay. Okay, so um, are there any other um, public comment? Uh, this is the moderator. Um, I did have a hand raised from Peter Ivory earlier, but I'm not sure if he still wants to speak. Okay, it looks like he does. So um, Peter, if you could please um, click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sarah. I hope everybody can hear me. Now, Peter Ivory, I'm the program director at Cal State LA. I'm not on the call with uh, Jody and the clinic directors, um, but thank you, Jody, for um, pre presenting the, the, the perspective that uh, I signed off on as well as program director. Um, I have very little to add uh, to what uh, Jody had said, um, except uh, I wanted to clarify for Dr. White that uh, from her uh, comments and, and questions that um, that the clinical training in the RPE, at least in the uh, at the best of my knowledge, in the four autonomous um, AUD programs in the CSU um, is an enrollment at the university, which is then a requirement number of number of units for graduation. So there's nothing that we can do to truncate those units uh, in those last three uh, terms of enrollment. Um, and so uh, we, we try to, uh, you know, at that point, the student has uh, no coursework left to do uh, and the intent uh, from the uh, accreditation. Uh, we're solely accredited by ACAE, by the way, uh, not uh, CAA at this time. Uh, and so um, it's the intent of the 
uh, of that time period that the student has um, full-time attention to their uh, to their work experience and, and not to any university activities per se. So that's all I wanted to contribute. Thank you, Jody. Thank you, uh, board members. Thank you, Marcia, for your uh, interest uh, on uh, in this on this subject. Thank you. All right, and this is the moderator. Appears there are no further requests for public comment. Would you like me to close that Q and A panel? Yes, thank you. So the action requested is that we have the discussion with that we have and to determine next steps. So I, I think um, considering all that we've learned this morning, we really have to go back to the drawing board a little bit. It sounds as though that drawing board is simplified quite a bit from what we anticipated, um, but that the um, committee and board staff need to discuss this further, um, make some decisions um, about possible changes or lack thereof um, going forward and bring this back uh, with some uh, more concrete decisions um, about what we want to implement in terms of what the sunset allows us to do, improvements in our processing timelines for the applications, um, and more practical matters like that. Um, Paul and Sharice, I'd appreciate any input you have on, on that notion. Yes, hi, Dr. Raja. This is Paul. I think that um, I, I think that we're in agreement. We a few things that I just want to point out, just just for the purposes of this discussion and future discussions, is that we don't have a choice when it comes to the twelve month requirement. And um, that's I know that's we, we all agree that we're requiring twelve months of required professional experience. That's established in. Uh, Business and Professions Code 2532.25. So when we talk about, you know, whether it's 11 or 12 months, it's not that we were asking whether people wanted 11 or 12 months. We were asking about consecutive uh, months. But I, I don't think, I think that's a moot point now. The other thing I wanted to point out is when it comes to clock hours, that's actually another statutory requirement. We can't just decide not to count clock hours the board has to establish clock hours, which they're already established as 300 clock hours, but we need to, we need the regulation to reflect that that applies to the requirements for audiologists that are set in business and professions code 2532.25. And then I think the other area that we need to address is uh, California code of regulations, um, I, I, that would be addressed in California Code of Regulations 1399.152.2 if I'm correct. And I'll let Cherise chime, chime in on that if, if I've got that code wrong. 152.2? Yeah, 1399.152.2. Is that the right code, Cherise? Or... Uh, I'm Maria. getting there that's right now. That's what's on the screen right now. Okay. Yes, that's got it. Yeah because it is what defines, sorry, I'm getting there. It, it defines the supervised clinical experience. So yes, we would need to update it to add 2532.25, just to make it clear that it applies to both um, and the correct subdivision. And so that 300 hours, um, clinical clock hours is fine. Um, and it's at the three different settings, which everyone has said is, is still fine and that you know, all of these provisions as stated, which they meet and exceed already, um, but that have always been required, they apply to 2532.25. Um, the one thing we would mention is that the statute for um, the older statute when audiologists were in with speech pathologists, um, 2532.2, that clarified in statute that 30 hours per week is full time. Um, right. That is not clarified in 2532.25, and we therefore would want to put it in um, some section on the required professional experience. And again, I would note that we define the supervised clinical experience in 1399.152.2, and then our regulations go to the exam requirements. We do not clarify in there 
um, about the professional experience requirement, but we do have regulations on the RPE that we can clarify that the full time means 30 hours. Um, it would be duplicative for the speech pathologist, but it would not be duplicative for the audiology side. So we could um, clarify that in the regulations and add those to any future draft language we bring to the board to make all these clarifications. Okay, so Sharice and Paul, are you in agreement that, that the committee will continue to work with board staff on clarifications, um, any uh, modifications, additions, and so on? Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely, and that staff will work on um, creating some draft language. I believe we would also want to um, put our forms in the regulations. That would also help with some of the items about um, what do directors need to put into the clinical verification form, um, and that would help with clarifying what's required, um, what they need to certify, and what that would kind of let us move that let us move that applying part earlier so that they can have everything ready, approved, and ready to go, and they're not stuck waiting on processing times. Okay. Um, so that sounds like a, um, a good plan moving forward. We don't need a motion, I believe. No. I don't believe so, but Kenneth can. Uh, there is one... Um, well, at this point, I can adjourn the uh, audiology practice committee uh, meeting. Um, the question is, do we, it, we've been talking for two hours, do we need a short break or should we um, kind of muscle through the last portion and then have our normal lunch break that we were planning on before the full board meeting? Any opinions about that? Uh, Dr. Raju, I think we need to probably take a, a short break, even just to transition over to the other group. Okay. Um, yeah, because the chair of the other group really needs a break. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, 10 minutes, would that be enough? That's great. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. So let's go ahead and call to order the Hearing Aid Dispensers Committee meeting let's start with the roll call make sure everyone's here dr Raggio here dr valdez here dr white here i am here and that is now a quorum because it looks like they were able to reduce the number of uh members required so huzzah paul So let's move right on to agenda item number two. Um, let's uh, have public comment for items not on the agenda. Moderator, if you could please open for public comment. This is the moderator and at the direction of the committee, I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment for items not on the agenda, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. And I'll pause a moment to allow the public time to access these features and submit their requests. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Please. Okay, so we have one uh, item on the agenda, review, discussion, and possible action on regulations regarding hearing aid dispensers, trainee, and temporary license supervision as stated in Title 16, California Code of Regulations, sections 1399.115, through 1399.119. Uh, Maria, if you could present the information to the committee, please. Good morning, everyone. This is Maria. Um, those proposed regulations will revise the supervision requirement for hearing aid dispensers training and temporary license, as well as the training requirements for trainees. Um, the committee has been reviewing this for the last few board meetings, um, reviewing the proposed language from November 2018. And the text presented today is um, includes the changes from the last discussion held in October 2022. 
Okay, let's um, go ahead and open it up for discussion. Um, I don't know if we need to read through every single line item. Is would uh, would the would the committee prefer that? Um, shall we just hit those highlights where we maybe each have individual questions? Is it correct to say that I mean we've worked on the language and the uh, concepts quite a bit already, and that these are kind of final products? Is 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 that a fair statement? Uh, yes, this was, um, the, I think the committee wanted to review the language since we've done, um, since there was additional changes at the last meeting. So the committee wanted to see um, it in kind of in like its final form. So yeah, we just did some cleanup from discussion regarding like multiple supervisions and clarifying the CE requirements um, to help with the um, process. And so if there are any questions with any of the highlighted portion, um, yeah, we could definitely take a look at it and see how we can clarify it further. Does anyone have any uh, further questions about any of the highlighted areas? I have one or two, but I want to open it up to the, the committee first. I just wanted to point out for clarification for stakeholders that um, these materials were already posted to the website under our meeting calendar so they can see the um, the draft language on the website. That's why it's not being shared on the screen. Thank you. I have one quick question on page four of seven, um, section three where it says the supervisor shall maintain records of course completion and supervision training for a period of four years after the renewal period in which it was earned. I'm curious, how many years do we keep records of uh, CEUs, just general CEUs for the licensure? Are we supposed to keep it for like five or seven or something like that? I believe it's two years. Um, let me check it, but it's my understanding the regular CEs is uh, two years. Two? And I thought it was much longer than that. Yeah, me too. The, the regular is two. Um, I think that is rather short um, comparatively, um, but a lot of times it's based on two renewal cycles um, or two or three renewal cycles with boards. And of course, okay. when you're on the dispensing side, you renew annually. So two renewal cycles is two years. Okay. Um, but it is rather short, and I think that's why we added that language to make sure the supervisor is holding on to that a little longer than their normal CE. Um, even though you probably hold on to your CE much longer than is required, um, we just wanted to be clear about that in there because we're also talking about um, every four years thereafter in the above division, subdivision D. So we just want to make sure, yeah, you got to hold on to it right. for those four years. Even though you're a regular CE, you maybe only have to hold on to it for two years, um, which okay. again, also up to the board to change how long you want them to hold on to everything. Well, I was going to suggest keeping it as long as we keep the CEUs, but since that's apparently a shorter time, not a longer time, I'd say, <laughs> and I'm fine with keeping it at the four because it, do, it does match um, in subsection D. So yeah, I'm I'm fine with that then. Thank you for the clarification. You're welcome. Okay. And I don't have any other issues. I will say though, um, for the record, I do continue to object to the inclusion um, under section 1399.118, the training required, requiring the ele electroacoustic analysis equipment and requiring the real ear measurement as a part of the training. Um, given the short aspect of the training, I just find that to be excessive. Sorry, I have to disagree. I think it's essential. Well, given the fact that, um, and I'll just say from my experience doing this for 25 years, I have worked uh, for companies that have had uh, that equipment and I work for companies that have not had that equipment. And I don't believe my, um, 
my ability to help the consumer uh, and protect the consumer and be able to give them a good experience with the hearing aid was necessarily hindered by not being able to have that equipment available. Science is would just agree it, with that. Um, is it best practice? Yes, but I think we need to delineate between what's required for training and what is best practice. These individuals are training for the purposes of getting licensed. This is not a three-year, four-year program. This is generally speaking a nine month is before they're getting licensed and adding that on, I think is overreach. And my concern is now the only people who are gonna be training dispensers are gonna be Costco. Well, I can't or, speak to that, but, but I find electroacoustic analysis is about as fundamental to dispensing as any, anything else in here. Um, if you don't know about it, don't know how to do it, don't understand the principles behind it, um, I, I think that makes you a lesser dis, uh, dispenser in terms of skill and knowledge. Well, the reality That's is... fundamental to me. It, it's not like an extraneous uh, aspect of training. It's fundamental. Well, the electroacoustical analysis for the purposes of determining what's wrong with the hearing aid. Someone comes with a hearing aid that says it's not working. I'm going to hook it up to the, to the box to try to figure out what's wrong with it. And then once I figure out what's wrong with it, I'm going to send it in the manufacturer to have it repaired. Would you agree with that? Yes, that seems reasonable. That's one use, yes. Okay. That's the primary use that a dispenser is going to use it for. Is for that. Now, whether I have that box in my office or not, when someone comes in with a hearing aid that's not functioning properly, and they come in and say it's weak or it's dead, and I visually inspect it, and I can see nothing wrong with it, I listen to it, and it is dead, and there is no function. Well, you can't. I'm going to send it in for repair. But that's not quite the scenario that you're. Uh, well, of course. Let's say let's let's say they're static, or they say the battery is the battery is low, or the the battery um, it's not holding the charge. I have to change the batteries every day, so I can plug it in and figure out is there is there excessive battery drain, or I can check it to see okay is it if they say it's weak is it meeting you know the ANSI standards to tell me whether or not the hearing aid is in fact weak functioning properly. I can go through all that and then I'm going to send the hearing aid in for repair. I can go through all that and tell them, no, this says it's working just fine. And the patient says, well, I'm just not hearing well with it. There's something wrong with it. I need it to be sent in. I'm not you wouldn't know if the noise reduction is active. You wouldn't know if the microphones are flipped backwards. There are a number of items yeah. that you the patient wouldn't be reporting to you necessarily yep. that you determine from EAA. You but wouldn't again. necessarily send it in in that case. I'm sorry, but wait a minute, because my understanding is we went through this process to talk about the supervision requirements and trying to have a somewhat higher standard for someone to go through a training process since there's no educational component required, et cetera. And now we're trying to say that it's not important that this trainee now have experience with and be taught how to use these different integral components to part of fitting hearing aids and hearing aid practices. Well, is that what we're saying? What I'm just saying is I'm telling, I am just want it on the record that I dispute whether or not this is required versus best practices and is recommended, which is what it was beforehand, before it was decided no, we're going to make it a part of training. We're not going to make it just recommended. I'd like to address those two scenarios you brought up. Um, it, it, you're correct. If uh, somebody comes in and says their hearing aid is dead and you use your listening check and so on to determine that it is dead, uh, you're right. I would send it in for repair and not uh, run it through electroacoustic analysis because I couldn't. You cannot run a dead hearing aid on True. electric. That, that was a poor example of mine. You're correct. But if they came in and said it's weak and I run it and it seems to meet ANSI standards and programming changes that I might have uh, uh, noted, 
before. Um, and they say, I'm still not hearing. The first thing I'm going to do is test their hearing and not send it in. I'm going to see, do they have a change in their hearing? Because that's really likely uh, when somebody comes in a year later saying, I'm not hearing as well as I first did, uh, I would do a hearing test. And then I would decide whether we needed to really send it in or not. Again, I don't dispute what, I, and I have never disputed what you and um, Amy are saying. I agree with that. As I said, I do it myself. But, but I don't as, think it's- But as a requirement, as a requirement for the initial training to then become licensed, because I'm looking at this as the person is being trained to become licensed. I know, and that I, I find and that's not a part of their licensure requirement. It's not a, it's not a high level extraneous requirement that is pie in the sky and maybe something extra and not important. Um, I, I don't see it that way at all. I, I see it as fundamental to understanding hearing aids. Well, then I think we should require it as a part of their uh, as a part of the licensure then. I, I'm fairly certain it is part of the licensure requirement in terms of the exams. I do not believe there is uh, any question on real or measurement or phi box. Real or measurement, but perhaps not. i pretty sure that's incorrect. Okay, well, I know we worked on those before <laughs> together. Well, be that as it may, we'll, I mean, it's, I'm outvoted um three to uh three to one so i guess we will move forward with it as it is can i ask again is the fry box the electroacoustic yes the electroacoustic i'm sorry okay no worries it's just much easier to say fry box than say electrical acoustic analysis equipment 27 times no totally fine i just did <laughs> non-expert non here not practicing does fry like, even make boxes still I don't know if they're even in existence. It's just the, so. it's like saying Kleenex instead of facial tissue. tissue. Okay. Audio scan. I guess we could refer them to the audio scan or affinity. Okay, that was the only issue I had, and I'm as again I will. I unfortunately have to bow to the uh, the majority of the committee. Um, is there any other questions concerning the? Um, any other issues that are highlighted of the changes? Okay, hearing none, then uh, moderator, can you please open up for a public comment? This is the moderator and at the direction of the committee, I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. And it looks like we have a request from uh, Joe Bartlett. And Joe, please click the unmute me button uh, when the prompt appears on your device. This is working. Yep, we can hear you. Okay, very good. Uh, yeah, I wanted to make a comment to uh, what Todd was saying. Um, I, I agree of the importance of uh, at more of an advanced level um, being able to to run some of these things. I think the the electroacoustic analysis is important when you're dealing with pediatrics, which we don't. We don't deal with pediatrics uh, really at all. You know, over the age of 16, we usually have at least a uh, a very um, uh, a, a party that can comment and give us at least their own commentary on how they're hearing. Um, and so I've been doing this 20 years. I have a fry, I have not, I almost said fry box. I have a, a brand new um, electroacoustic analysis really to test this idea out. And in my experience, I have used it three times. And even then, um, when it came to my training and my dispensing license, um, nothing was on my testing, granted this was 20 years ago, uh, when it came to the actual performance of doing this task, 
but the knowledge of what is actually happening came further on when it when I was even doing my ACA credentialing. It was not something that was done in the uh, like the written test and all of those of, of actually techniques of running it, uh, but how to interpret results and all that. I believe that's important to know of how to interpret it. But I think that I think that the point of what we're what you guys are trying to mention is more of the knowledge of. Uh, verification techniques, which I remember was some of the original language that we were working on um, or, or was, was worked on by the board when I was when we were able to attend uh, back in the day, was people should know how to verify a fitting. They should know how to run some tests on systems. But when you start requiring the equipment and requiring that people have it, you're also you're talking about a large investment for some uh, uh, practices, as well as, uh, uh, again, not a, not very uh, regularly used, uh, unless, like you said, like a Costco or maybe Todd, if you're working for a, a company that's that requires that every hearing aid come in be done on a on a on a test box. I've just never felt the need for that, and I've had trainees that I've worked with, and and there is a, a certain amount of value of listening test. And then I know to Marsha's uh, 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 mention of if someone says it's weak, doing a new test on them, that's a that's a great idea. And in fact, that equipment is already available to a trainee, and that's an audiometer. You know, and if the, the test has not changed, then, you know, by, by, I ultimately say that everything you're saying that needs to happen in a test box can be done simply by process of elimination and utilizing the manufacturer when it comes to repair of a hearing aid. So I, I, I again, I don't have a vote in this sense, but I really think this is something that should be um, rethought. And uh, in the last board meetings that the comment was happening was uh, we had a lobbyist and he wasn't quite sure of the exact process. So if it's too little too late, I would, that, that's where that is. But I really think you should reconsider uh, requiring someone to have that equipment for training versus it just a knowledge of, of what the results mean and, and, and knowledge of verification techniques, including real ear and these sort of things. So I appreciate my, your time and letting me uh, state my comments. Is there any further comment? Uh, this is the moderator. It appears there are no further requests for public comment. Did you want me to close that Q&A panel? Please. Okay. So are we at a point where we are to um, do a roll call vote to I guess um, to approve it as it is, or just to send it to the uh, to the main board for discussion and vote. Mr. Chair, this is Legal Counsel Ken Swenson. I have a proposed or recommended form of motion that you might want to consider. Okay, it would be, go as, ahead. Fo it would be as follows. The recommended form of motion would be for the hearing aid dispensers committee to recommend to the full board that one, the proposed amended regulatory text relating to the hearing aid dispensers trainee and temporary license supervision as stated in title 16 California code of regulations sections 1399.114 through 1399.119 be approved and adopted Two. Staff be directed to take all steps necessary to notice the amended regulatory text and to make any non-substantive changes to the regulatory package. And three, if no adverse comments are received during the 15-day comment period, the executive officer be authorized and directed to take all steps necessary to complete the rulemaking and to adopt the proposed amended regulations as noticed. Okay. That sounds good. Would someone like to make a motion? Can I say so moved? That was a lot of text. Yes, that's uh, a motion and a second. So moved and so seconded would be sufficient. So moved. Second. Marie, if you could call the roll, please. Uh, we need public comment before the rolls oh, call. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, let's uh, um, open for public comment, please. 
this is the moderator and at the direction of the committee, I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. And I'll pause a moment to allow the public time to access these features and submit the requests. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Please. I'll go ahead and call the roll for you. Mr. Borges? Aye. Dr. Raggio? Aye. Dr. Valdez? Aye. Dr. White? Aye. And the motion carries. Thank you. And as that is our one and only item on the agenda, I will uh, adjourn the committee meeting. Okay. Um, it, we still have a half an hour before lunch, but would you? Is this a good time, staff? Do you think to break before we start into the full board meeting? I don't know about Paul, but it it could be worthwhile to go ahead and get through some meeting minutes at least before. Okay, I'm okay with that. Yeah, I agree. I would leave it up to the board. Um, this is the moderator. Let me go ahead and stop the recording and start a new one for the board meeting. Absolutely. Dr. Raggio? Here. Ms. Kaiser? Here. Mr. Borges? Here. Ms. Chang? Here. Ms. Dominguez? Here. Dr. Valdez? Here. Dr. White? Here. Yeah, I believe we have a quorum. A quorum has been established. I'd like to move on to agenda item two, public comment for items not on the agenda. If the moderator wouldn't mind opening for public comment. This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment uh, for items not on the agenda, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. And I'll pause a moment to allow the public time to access these features and submit their requests. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, thank you. Okay, agenda item three is review and possible approval of October 27, 28, 2022 board meeting minutes. And then Maria, I think we'll start this discussion. Thank you, Dr. Raggio. Um, October minutes includes the board meeting regarding the board strategic plan, business moder modernization project, FDA's final rule on OTC hearing aids, uh, removal of hearing, uh, hearing um, of remo dome removals, and the sunset process for audiology assistant. At this meeting, the board adopted modified text to propose regulatory language regarding notice to consumers and RP supervision, elected board chair, chair and vice chair for 2023, uh, proposed potential dates for board meetings in 2023, and proposed legislation to replace gender pronoun in the Boards Practice Act. Also included are the audiology practice and hearing aid dispensing committees, committees minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there any board discussion on these minutes? Seeing and hearing none, I'd like to ask for a motion to accept um, the October 27, 28, 2022 board meeting minutes as stated. I move to accept the board meeting minutes from October 27, 28, 2022. I second. Thank you. 
Can we ask uh, that the moderator open for public comment? This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. I'll pause a moment to allow the public time to access these features and submit their requests. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, thank you. Is there any further board discussion? Seeing none, I'd like to call the roll, or have Sharice call the roll call. Oh. Dr. Braggio? Aye. Ms. Kaiser? Aye. Mr. Borges? Aye. Ms. Chang? Aye. Ms. Dominguez? Aye. Dr. Valdez? Aye. Dr. White? Aye. Motion carries. Moving along to agenda item four, review and possible approval of the December 13, 2022 board meeting minutes. Again, Maria, would you like to tell us about those? Thank you, Dr. Raggio. Um, December's minutes includes the board meeting regarding proposed regulations in the rulemaking process. At this meeting, the board reviewed public comments and approved board responses for proposed re regulations regarding notice to consumers, RP supervision, and uniform standards. Okay, is there any board discussion? Yes. Um, uh, sorry, this is Holly. Um, I just noticed on page 51, which was, let me get back to it, um, for asking for public uh, comment that um, that the, the person that, that is re referred to is Michelle and there's no last name. Um, my memory, if, if it's serving me well, was that it was Michelle uh, Linares, the, cha the chair at the time of Kasha. And I thought that her last name should have been included. I think staff didn't include it because on the roster of the WebEx, it only said Michelle. Um, but yes, we can we'll, add that. We'll, um, that's changed the noted. Thank you. Any further discussion by board members? Seeing none, I'd like to ask for a... Uh, a motion to accept the, the December 13, 2022 board meeting minutes as amended. Motion to accept the board meeting 20, uh, December 13, 2022 meeting, mended, meeting minutes as amended. Second. Thank you. Can I ask the moderator to open for public comment, please? This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. And I'll pause a moment to allow the public time to access the features and submit their requests. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, thank you. Is there any further board discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask Sharice to call the, the vote. Absolutely, Dr. Raggio? Aye. Ms. Kaiser? Aye. Mr. Borges? Aye. Ms. Chang? Aye. Ms. Dominguez? Aye. Dr. Valdez? Aye. Dr. White? Aye. And the motion carries. Thank you. Um, I see uh, item number five is DCA update from DCA Board and Bureau of Relations. I see that Yvonne Durantes is on the call. Yvonne, would this be a good time 
to make your report as opposed to waiting till after lunch? Hi there, yes, I can provide an update now. Okay. Just a moment, let me pull up. All right, um, are you able to hear me all right? Yes. Hi there. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Yvonne Durantis. I am the Assistant Deputy Director of Board and Bureau Relations, and I'm, I'm happy to provide an update today. And so, um, you know, in December, um, we announced the appointment of Kathleen Nichols as the new Chief of Division of Investigation, and she was sworn in on December 5th. And she has extensive law enforcement experience with over 26 years of investigating and supervisory experience. And so the department began with the process to fill the deputy chief position in health quality investigation unit. Also providing an update on the DCA diversity, equity and inclusion steering committee. Um, the department established its first diversity, equity, and inclusion steering committee to guide the department's equity strategy initiatives and action plans. And so the DEI committee held its second meeting on January 27th of 2023 to review and discuss the committee charter, DCA 2023 equity action plan, strategic planning process, leadership survey, and DEI fact sheet. Additional resources will be forthcoming that the boards will be able to use and incorporate into their strategic plans, recruitment process, and the committee will concentrate on the following three areas. Um, number one, excuse me, Yvonne. Uh -huh. Hello. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, Yvonne, but I just wanted to let you know that we're getting some static. I don't know if everyone's hearing it, but I'm hearing some static feedback and it's a little bit hard to hear you right now. Let, I don't know if it's your really headset or something. Up. Yeah, let me switch my audio real quick. Give me a minute. Okay. Thank you. Welcome to WebEx. Press one to be connected to your meeting. Hi there, is this better? Yes. That sounds better. Okay, great. Should I start all over to um, provide the, the full update? I, I think we heard it. It just wasn't as clear. So I, I, I heard the update, so I'm not sure about everyone else. Got it. Okay, then I'll, I'll just pick up um, where I was at in terms of reviewing the three areas that the diversity, equity, and inclusion steering committee is focusing on. And so the first key area is workforce um, to find and keep diverse talent. The second area is workplace to actively educate leaders and employees to raise awareness and foster an inclusive culture. And number three, marketplace um, to be sensitive to the diverse backgrounds and perspectives of consumers, applicants, and licensees. And so I have the pleasure of being on this steering committee alongside your EO, um, Paul. And so we will be um, meeting again in a couple months and we will be providing additional information and resources as they become available. But in the meantime, if there are any questions at all in terms of diversity, equity and inclusion, please feel free to reach out to either myself or, or to Paul and we can work together to answer any questions um, that may come about. And so alongside that, um, an update on our strategic planning process, um, the department's DEI steering committee is also working to implement the governor's executive order, which includes incorporation of diversity, equity, and inclusion into strategic planning. And so our um, solid team is working with a D the DEI steering committee to develop DEI related questions for inclusion and in environmental scan surveys and SWOT analysis to help guide the boards and bureaus in developing DEI related goals and objectives as a part of their strategic plans. And so sample DEI objectives will also be provided to further assist boards and bureaus in developing their goals and objectives. DCI, 
DCA is also developing video messages from leaders to explain their perspective on DEI and how it relates to board and board roles and policies. Once these new DEI components have been finalized and approved by our SOLID team, SOLID will begin working with DCA's board and bureaus on the development of the new strategic plans or updating the strategic plans that already exist. And we will keep your executive officer updated as more information becomes available. Moving on to an update on our new strategic plan and logo. Um, so if you don't already know, DCA did release its new strategic plan in November and uh, officially transitioned to a new logo in January um, of 2023. And so this new logo will be implemented gradually throughout this year. And existing items with previous DCA logos are still valid um, during this transition period and do not need to be replaced or updated. DCA board and bureau leadership have been given information and resources to help the new logos implementation. But if you do want additional information, we do have a website with um, centralized information about the new logo and that is www.dca.ca.gov forward slash logo. And so the new plan and logo represents um, the department's next chapter in the future with consumer protection guiding our guide, um, guiding our mission and priorities. And so obviously DCA holds itself to very high standard in terms of uh, being a licensing entity, a regulator, educator, and service provider. And so we plan to incorporate our strong commitment and diversity include equity and inclusion as well as our shared commitment to each consumer. And so a little bit about the new logo. Um, not only does it display our state's official colors, but it also visually represents DCA's vision of together protecting California consumers. Um, and so there's a shield on the new logo, which represents DCA's strong and longstanding protection mandate. Uh, there's the state itself, um, which symbolizes 40 million Californians, which DCA has pledged and is honored to serve. And then there's also the star, which symbolizes consumer protection as DCA's true guiding principle, uh, representing our own North Star. And so if there are any questions in regard to the new logo, um, we are also happy to answer any questions um, in regard to that. And so since it's still um, you know, early in the year, um, we wanted to take this opportunity to remind board members of required training um, and the need uh, for submitting your certificates of completion to both your executive officer and also to DCA at member relations at dca.ca.gov. And so for 2023, there are two uh, DCA wide mandatory trainings. And this includes the sexual harassment prevention training, as well as the information security awareness training. And so all DCA employees and appointees, including board members, will need to complete the sexual harassment prevention training this year. This training is required every odd numbered year and is approximately two hours. And so in addition, if you are assigned a DCA email, um, so one ending with at dca.ca.gov, you are also required to complete the Information Security Awareness Fundamentals 2023 training. And so this Information Security Awareness training uh, helps everyone's role in um, addressing, protecting DCA's data and information. And, um, it's very crucial to to just be aware, um, you know, of, of some of the basic information security uh, policies for DCA. And so this training is only about 15 minutes. And so it's required every year. And so both the sexual harassment prevention training and the information security awareness trainings are available in the department's learning management system, um, which we commonly refer to as LMS. And so if there are any issues with um, you being able to log into LMS, um, you know, if it's whether your your email or your password, um, feel free to, to email me. Um, I can help and assist with all of that. And my email is Yvonne, Y-V-O-N-N-E dot Dorantes, D-O-R-A-N-T-E-S at D-C-A 
www.ca.gov. And so I'm happy to help with that. And so, like I said, both of these required trainings can be accessed at any time they're available on LMS. Um, and so in the next few weeks, we will also be sending out information on how to access these trainings. And so at any time, if you have any questions, please reach out. Um, an additional uh, training that is required for board members is the board member orientation training, also referred to as BEMA. And so within the first year of appointment or reappointment, um, ethics training is also required. Um, that's also required within the first six months of appointment and also every two years thereafter. Um, there's also the defensive driver training, which is required the first year of appointment and also every four years. And so also for your convenience, these trainings are offered multiple times a year and in various different formats. And so BMO will actually be available um, in a little bit under um, a month. It'll be available um, on March 22nd and it'll be a live, a virtual day of training. And so um, as a reminder, it's required within one year of appointment and every reappointment. And so um, March 22nd will be offered live online, um, but um, there will also be two additional dates this year, which include June 20th and October 10th. And these will likely be either a hybrid version or actually in So please visit LMS for any additional information in regard to that. Um, there's also a page that we have available on our DCA board members resource uh, center page where you can find all of this information that I just, um, you know, went over. I know it's a law. I know there are various different trainings and I know, um, you know, there's different requirements in terms of timelines. And so if you do have any questions, please visit that um, member resource center page or um, email myself or your EO. And so um, coming up in a couple of days, we have the end of the COVID-19 state of emergency waiver coming up on February 28th. And so the state of emergency and the associated executive orders, um, which are N3920 and N7520 will be coming to an end on February 28th. And upon this state of emergency ending, um, all the active waivers that were issued under this authority will also expire. So um, we just wanted to take a moment to thank you for your dedicated service, your patience, and all of your hard work through the pandemic. And so if there are any issues or concerns, please reach out with any questions. Um, and so with March quickly approaching as well, um, we also wanted to take this moment as an opportunity to remind you um, to file your annual form 700 by March 15th of this this year. And so board and committee members are required to file a statement of economic interest, which is also known as the form 700 within 30 days of their appointment annually and within 30 days of leaving office. And so this year's annual filing period covers the prior calendar year, which includes January 1st of 2022 through December 31st of 2022. And so the final deadline for filing is Friday, April 1st. However, to ensure compliance, DCA requests that Form 700 filers please complete their e-filing by Friday, March 15th, um, just to make sure there aren't any issues. And so you should have recently received an email from NetBio with instructions on how to file your annual form 700. Um, but if you do have any issues, haven't received the email or there's any um, questions as to how to go about it, please contact Melissa Gear, um, the deputy director over board and bureau relations. And her email is melissa.gear and that's M-E-L-I-S-S-A dot G-E-A-R at D-C-A dot C-A dot G-O-V. And of course you can also email your um, EO which can always um, delegate the, the questions over to BBR. Um, and so those are all the DCA updates that I have. And like I mentioned, um, happy to answer any questions or concerns in regard to 
um, the required training, um, the upcoming Beaumont session that we have in March, the end of the waiver, um, and also happy to answer any questions in regard to the DEI steering committee. But thank you for this opportunity to provide an update on behalf of board and bureau relations team. Thank you. Thank you so much for that um, update. Is there any board discussion or do you have questions about her report? I just have one question about having to retake these, the training modules every other year. It, what is the philosophy behind having to retake um, courses that you've already taken and passed or whatever the term is? Yeah. So I think there's a couple of things, you know, sometimes we have, you know, slightly shifting policy and we want to make sure that all of the members are all on the same page. And, um, you know, in two years, um, you know, we may forget some of the stuff. So again, we just want to make sure that everyone is up to date and on the same page and, um, you know, that we ensure, um, you know, healthy collaboration all around as much as possible. So that's, that's the thinking, um, you know, behind that. Okay, thank you. Any other board members with uh, questions or uh, discussion items? Seeing none, can we open um, for public comment, please? This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. I'll pause a moment to allow the public time to access these features and submit their requests. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, thank you. Thank you again for uh, your report, Iman. It's very informative. Um, according to our formal agenda, we have three more items before we break for lunch, but it is noon. Um, so I'm going to propose that we break for lunch now uh, if everybody's in agreement. Anybody not in agreement? I'm fine with um, the lunch. Can we make it 30 minutes or? Yeah. That sounds good, sounds good to me. It's okay with everybody else. I'm good with Perfect. that. Okay, Sorry. so why do we get back together in 30 minutes? 